Yes, this meeting is being recorded, so uh, I hope you can uh, agree uh, with that. Um, colleagues, this is quite an exciting uh, um, development here, um, a quite exciting agenda. You will hear in a moment from Lars Montelius, who is one of the signatories of this manifesto, the Materials 2030 manifesto, what it is about and what uh, the next steps are, but let me put it in, in the context as we see it. Uh, um, we have a very good starting position that, uh, or maybe even the luxury, um, that Europe is a global leader when it comes to advanced materials. Um, and um, we all know how important uh, advanced materials are for our industrial fabric. Uh, materials matter. 20% uh, I think of the value added uh, in industry is uh, associated to um, materials and 70% and of innovations rely on new uh, advanced materials. So um, the basic insight behind the Materials 2030 manifesto was that we need in order to keep our leading position, we need a systemic approach. And uh, the ambition uh, in terms of output and direction comes from the what we call here the trend transition, the digital transition towards sustainability and the green transition uh, towards um, climate neutrality and a circular regenerative economy. And um, one of the novel elements in this um, material agenda is that it has inbuilt the ambition of acting together, of connecting different actors um, downstream and upstream. Uh, that's one first element, but also with a new level of ambition to include also um, you and me as persons, as citizens, um, the, the, the users, and for that we also um, have the privilege to um, have the commitment from the design com designers community uh, to be part of it, to uh, shape this um, participatory co-creation uh, approach to, um, to, to, to develop this uh, common uh, agenda for materials. The objective is uh, quite clearly um, uh, formulated in um, that materials manifesto, the vision that we would drive the green and digital tra uh, transition um, with advanced materials and um, to contribute substantially to an inclusive European society. So that's that's the overall objective. Um, so. It was a bit of a bet when we um, started this process, which uh, I would like to underline here is um, not a project driven by the EU Commission. Um, we are part of it, um, um, but um, it's driven by stakeholders. And the main objective of today's event would be, is um, that we, not only create a new level of transparency, what it is about, but that we create new connections, new engagement, and that you find your way, if you're not yet part um, of an action, um, that you find your way to participate in, in this initiative, which is dynamic and bigger than I personally thought when we started it. Um, uh, less than a year ago with the publication with, uh, of the manifesto, which um, my commissioner, Maria Gabriel, uh, received and uh, welcomed. Um, so what happened then is that uh, these materials, passionate activists, if you wish, um, developed a, a roadmap a Matthias 2030 roadmap, how to achieve our, our vision and realize our vision. And with that, the dynamic started that more and more um, individuals, researchers, companies, 
joined and it was driven by something which is characterizing the cooperative nature of European research, the technology platforms. And uh, with these technology platforms, and I, I would like to mention them, it's Oymart, it's Sasken, it's Money Future, and um, the Energy Materials Industrial Initiative, better known as MIRI. And with that, we reached uh, more than uh, 100 action, uh, uh, actors. Um, working on this uh, roadmap and um, the next step and you will hear more about that is um, to turn this roadmap into a novel uh, research and innovation agenda for advanced materials in, in Europe with a new ambition for participatory uh, um, uh, outreach uh, which corresponds to also to um, the new ambition of this manifesto um, to look at the developments of new materials from a market perspective. What are the future markets? And to have that embedded in the priority setting uh, from the very beginning. So um, that's in a nutshell. Um, what is at stake and how we intend to, to achieve it. Um, this entails quite a number of um, new forms of sharing, of cooperating. And to be very frank, um, we have to develop these new forms um, now. It's not that we can take an existing blueprint and, and copy it. And, and that makes also part of the uh, charm of, of such an initiative. I would like to put it also in the more geopolitical context of, uh, and of industrial policy. Uh, I think everyone uh, here in this meeting is aware of the commitment from the European Commission, as uh, our President Ursula von der Leyen put in her last year's State of the Union speech, um, that we will present um, this year a critical raw materials act to reduce our dependencies um, to strengthen our um, strategic open autonomy and I'm, I'm simplifying a bit um, the critical raw materials um, act is about access and extracting and the advanced uh, materials agenda we are having here is accompanying this very important um, uh, action, the Critical Motives Act, by putting the emphasis on developing new stuff um, without necessarily extracting and substituting um, critical raw materials and looking at the future markets um, as, as, as target. So, um, I mentioned already that we have a, a strong position in Europe. Let, let me briefly come back to that. Um, because it's not that often. Uh, if you if you look at a uh, uh, report from McKinsey Global Institute uh, recently on um, competitiveness, they looked at uh, 10 what they call transversal, transversal uh, technologies and uh, compared to the US, uh, China, the EU is uh, only leading in advanced materials. They're good in manufacturing, um, uh, but real lead is in um, advanced materials. So we can build on, on the strengths. And I think the response to the manifesto and what the work invested in that uh, so far confirms uh, our strengths. And our strengths relies in this uh, cooperation. And actually, cooperation also means that we cooperate um, and we have very closely align our actions, uh, EU actions, with the national initiatives. Yes. And this meeting takes place, place actually in the context of a high level expert group we had uh, had on advanced materials. And I, I have personal memories um, uh, of my last meeting with this group, uh, which was at the time still in the Covent Garden building here in Brussels. I'm happy to see that uh, quite a number of colleagues. Um, from from that group are, are here today. So um, that is, I think, what makes Europe um, 
the ball in with all its diversity and different competence levels uh, strong if we act strongly um, together. And one example of this is um, um, the error nets we have um, in the field of uh, materials, and um, in particular um, the M, uh, the M error net, the materials error net, um, uh, which is a key instrument to um, to keep us together and um, um, bring us together, um, national <coughs> and and European measures. So to conclude, uh, there are three points uh, for today. Uh, first, um, this meeting uh -huh. takes place in the context of the, um, the initiative from the AIM, AMI, AMI, it's like the French uh, um, friend, AMI 2030. Um, initiative. So I'm very grateful uh, for all um, the hard work, the committed work uh, in the common European interest of um, of this uh, stakeholder group, and I'm very much looking forward to receiving uh, your proposal for a novel uh, agenda in the field of uh, advanced materials. Um, second. This is key for today. Um, we really wish that uh, you engage. If you're not yet part of it, that you engage uh, and you see how to engage and what you can bring so that we are even stronger um, in, in developing and then acting on this uh, initiative. And um, you can count on our continued uh, support from the Commission um, to um, with the tools and instruments we have at our um, disposition to contribute to the success of this initiative, which is so important for our industrial fabric and our uh, agenda for sustainability. Thank you very much. I hand back to Jürgen in our studio. Thank you, Peter. I hope everybody can hear me now. Okay. So, Happy New Year to everybody. I had to do many thanks, Peter, for those introductory remarks. I had my sports this morning now changing offices. <laughs> so, good to see such a great interest here. Um, in terms of ensuring a good um, connectivity, it would be good that only the speakers switch on the camera and also other people get uh, muted so that we avoid any sounds or disturbing sounds. And you see here these nice instructions for this software, WebEx, um, please respect this. What I would like now to show to you, uh, and many thanks, Peter, again, very briefly, what is the agenda for today? So you heard Peter Drell, uh, the Director for Prosperity. We'll get then for 20 minutes an introduction by Lars Montelius, but before I hand over to him, there will be the possibility then after his presentation to ask questions and answers. And in this regard on questions and answers, we would like to use Slido. Therefore, you will get a Slido code, um, which I will show after I've presented this agenda and then so as you see the Slido code, uh, so you see a hashtag 4646089, or you take the code for asking questions. These questions will be then posted here, and then the speakers can answer them. Since we have so many people, comments which people would like to make statements, they can go into the chat box of WebEx, but I will not take questions from WebEx, otherwise with so many participants, it, it looks a bit complicated. Statements in here in the chat box of WebEx, yes. Questions please via Slido, via this Slido code. Now, can we return to the agenda? Good. So after this general introduction of this initiative by Lars Montelius, uh, we would like to give the opportunity to the chairs of the different working groups and this will be Gerhard Goldbeck, Jose Caldera, 
Justin, Justin van Scapen and Eva Schillinger, and this will take us until uh, beyond lunch. Each time you will get the possibility to ask questions, to give feedback, uh, statements, as I said in the chat box uh, of WebEx, questions to the speakers via the Slido code. And at the very end, from a quarter to two to a quarter to three, I'm very happy to moderate a panel to get feedback, but also to broaden the debate. And then there will be concluding remarks from my side. Uh, and we finish by 3 p.m. Many thanks, therefore, that we have such a large interest. Maybe we show again the Slido code whilst I'm introducing Lars Montelius, because I would like to hand over now to you, Lars. Everybody who is dealing with nanotechnologies and doesn't know Lars Montelius, I would say, because you have been um, the Director General of the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory for eight years, a leading figure, but you are a professor from Lund, in, in Lund, in Lund the Lund University in Sweden. Uh, you are the research co-chair of this initiative, so you're a leading figure. And uh, let me add also that you have been the, one of the signatories of this Matthias 2030 manifesto. And I'm pretty sure, Lars, you will also show to this. Uh, I'm happy to hand over now to Lars, because everybody should have seen this. Over to you, Lars, and uh, good morning to you. And Happy New Year to everybody, should I have not yet said it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. And uh, thank you, Peter, also for a very good introduction to this. And uh, very nice to see so many of you gathered here today, and I'm happy to be here to try to guide you through what is the Advanced Materials 2030 initiative all about and why do we do this and why are we so passionate about this. So can I have the next slide? Uh, just as to give you an overview of the timeline. So as was mentioned by Peter already in nearly one year ago in February 22, there was a Materials 2030 manifesto. And then having that as a manifesto, which was a call for action, if you like, and it was a bottom up initiative by a number of stakeholders that had been working over the autumn of 2021 in order to make this manifesto. The manifesto is not very comprehensive, so there was a need to put more uh, meat to the bone. And we did that by engaging the European technology platforms. And then it was an elaborated roadmap or draft roadmap. And then this draft roadmap was presented in Grenoble in June in the Industrial Technology Conference. And then over the summer period until now in the autumn, it was kind of finalized. And then more people were working on finalizing the draft roadmap to make all the different components integrated into this draft, into this roadmap. And then a lot of stakeholders has been engaged over the, let's say, autumn of 2022. So more than 400 stakeholders have been working on making this kind of strategic agenda. How do we foresee that we need to put efforts into advanced materials in Europe? Why do we need to do that? What is the need and what is the purpose of it? So now in February 23, in one month from now, we will have a strategic agenda for advanced materials. And those of you that has been in, those of you that have been engaged yet, thank you so much for all your engagement. And those of you who have not yet been engaged, please engage. You all voices are needed. So this is really for people and planet and for prosperity. So it, everything is included. And then by the end of this this year, we expect that we will have a multi-dimension initiative that is ready and in place to capture all the value chains, innovation markets and stakeholders for an inclusive and increased innovation in Europe. So let me go to the next slide, please. So just to repeat what was the manifesto all about. So we captured our ideas that we worked during the autumn of 21 uh, into one vision, and I will read this vision because I think it's very important. A strong European materials ecosystem. So I think this this is what we what we like to achieve, of course. 
we already have some part, but we'd like to make it even stronger, to drive the green and digital transitions alongside a sustainable, inclusive European society. And here comes again these very important words, sustainable and inclusive and society, through a systemic collaboration between upstream developers, downstream users and citizens and all stakeholders in between. So the the manifesto was signed by the number of people. We were eight entities that signed this, and as Peter indicated, also the design people uh, are involved in this, which we think is very important. Uh, besides research to all organizations and industries. So if we take the next slide, just to give you the uh, kind of how how the manifesto was further developed by the help of the four European technology platforms that are the four uh, mostly relevant platforms for materials, the EMEDI platform, the UMAT, the SUSCAM, and the Manufuture. So they worked very hard in the spring of 22 to really try to get out a, a strategic roadmap of how should we actually enable the vision of the Mandatares Manifesto to come into reality? So the kind of uh, overall shape is this kind of house, if you like, where we have the two bottom floors, which is the evidence-based policy recommendations, the connectivity of blue sky research all the way up to the market demands, and then having on top an inclusive governance, which is a new form of cooperation, uh, that Peter touched a little bit upon, and then having the three, let's say, pillars, which are the three main pillars, building blocks, if you like, which is one is about the materials digitalization, one is about the materials production and processing, and one is the materials priority areas. So this connects and makes the kind of house of the Advanced Materials 2030 initiative, or if you like, the way we structured the 2030 roadmap. So if we take the next slide, here we, when we started the work to make the roadmap, we identified nine innovative markets, um, and we took them because we believe these are the main, most important innovation markets. There may be more, and that can be included, of course. But the nine they are healthcare, construction, new energies, transport, home and personal care packaging, agriculture, textiles, and electronics appliances. So we have these nine innovation markets, and what we tried to do was to capture what are the commonalities, what are the things that are in common between these different innovation markets, and how would the generic aspects of advanced materials enable new innovations to get into these different markets? And we kind of coined this spillover approach where we first say, let's identify a number of innovation markets. We have clear kind of commonalities. And then secondly, after that, try to make these commonalities to diffuse over to the other ones. So really to build step by step a connected house or a connected set of innovation markets in Europe, or if you like a connected innovation Europe. So next slide, please. So if you if you think about the materials initiative, there are kind of two basic parts. One is the combination of the digital technologies. And we believe this digital technology will revolutionize the way we actually conduct research and development. So new methodologies based on that. And then on the right hand side, the integration, the inclusive integration of the development of materials, the production and the processing. And these three integration elements creates new opportunities. And then the expected benefits we have here in the middle, there are, I, I will not read everything, I just say accelerating, low resource and decarbonization, established circular value chains, alternative processing solutions, increased product customization, warranty and labeling, and traceability and life cycle management. So these are the six expected benefits. So, and this was the core of the Advanced Materials Initiative. So let's have the next slide. You will all get the slides, by the way, afterwards, so you don't need to worry about that. 
Can I have the next slides? Okay, thank you. So the the way we thought about this was to have three key dimensions. And one dimension uh, is what you see, it's already a busy slide here, but what you see as uh, horizontal blocks, which are the main segments of the advanced material circle value chain. Uh, then on the uh, uh, vertical ones, you have the cross-sectional enablers, and then you have the nine innovation markets. So these are the three key dimensions where we tried now to establish in the European strategic agenda about how we can connect these to an errors in, of intervention, what would be the outcome that we could expect or to get from this. So you see the, the four main segments is about method design, development, production, it's transformation and integration into components, products and systems, the use phase of the materials, of course, and then end of life. So this is the four parts and then the cross sectional enablers you can see there, and we we kind of try to merge and say if we should have a connect commonality between at least two of the segments of the uh, circular value chain segments and at least two of the cross enablers and at least two of the innovation markets, we would really get an integration and then we could start to discuss and start to understand how could we actually roll this out. And this was the basis for the strategic agenda, uh, as well as the roadmap, of course, but also for the bid for the agenda now. So next slide, please. So when we looked at what, how having had this, as I said before, then say, okay, what are the targeted activities? There is, of course, research and innovation that is needed, obviously. And then there are other activities, and these are activities towards the market, the regulatory, and the societal uptake. When we go to the research and innovation, we know that there are, I mean, the basic stuff is about nine different technology readiness level. I can take the next slide, by the way, because it's, uh, uh, yeah, okay. So we, we out of these nine technology uh, readiness levels, we believe that the core of the AIMA 2030 will be between three and eight. But we do not exclude anything. We like to connect with the blue sky research, which is principally minus infinity, if you like, on the technology readiness level uh, of the TRL one, uh, and then connect it all the way up to TRL nine and into the market. So these are the targeted activities for the research and innovation. We do not exclude anything. So we are putting everything there. And then when it comes to the market, the regulatory society uptake. It's about the sustainable framework. It's about regulations, policies. It's about certification and standardization. We are speaking about like digital passports, etc. It's activities to education and training, reskilling. It's activities to entrepreneurship, very important. So the connectivity of the SMEs and the startups, etc., very important. And then activities to the public awareness and citizen involvement, as Peter emphasized in the beginning. This is for all of us, not only as scientists or industrialists, but those as people serving or be living on our planet. So everything is based on this green digital transition and then towards these targeted activities. So next slide, please. Uh, now I would like to define what is really the problem that we're having. So, so there, there are two things here, the problems and needs. So let's look on the left side first, the problems. So what are the challenges? What are the failures? Or what are the gaps, if you like, in the now called European, but I would say international domain, but specifically in the European domain, what are our problems in Europe? So first of all, there is an increased complexity of developed new materials, and this increased complexity is a function of the profound transformation towards a safe and sustainable society. So it's much more complicated, much more complexity in developed new materials. Then we do have a fragmentation among different players in Europe. Our leadership on advanced materials innovation that Peter said we have a good mark right now in Europe, it is challenged. It is challenged by other initiatives in the world, and we need to keep up. We need to become and keep our leadership. And also our 
manufacturing competitiveness is also challenged. We need to recreate some manufacturing. We need to increase the manufacturing and we need to put uh, more efforts into that. And then lastly, the linear value chains that exist today, they're not really suited for the exponential increase in demand that is driven by the green digital transition. So there is a problem with the value chains that are linear. So we need to do more circular, circular value chains. So these are the problems. And then when it comes to the needs, what, what do we need in order to address these problems? We need new solutions. We need stakeholders to be aligned and integrated on common goals with shared benefits. We need ambitious and coordinated investments in everything in skills, resource, infrastructures. We need EU policy frameworks, very important. We need increased autonomy on raw and advanced materials. We need a secured circular symbiotic value chains. So this is in, in contrast to the linear value chains. So these are the needs. So here we have a problem definition, the needs from the RE industrial and regulatory perspective. Of course, very uh, briefly explained right now. So next slide, please. If we think about the global expected outputs and the results, so to the left, we have the expected outputs, and these are direct outcomes of the initiative. So we expect that we will develop game changes that really have a big impact in the market. We expect that we will develop a systemic collaboration that will truly integrate all stakeholders along the value chains of advanced materials. We expect that we will develop a common toolbox, the materials commons, to support the development of safe and sustainable materials products, compliant with regulations, standards, frameworks, product passport, etc. And we expect to develop synergies between regional, national, European and international initiatives and programs. Europe is not alone. We are in a global world, of course. So we need to align and we need to interact with this happening in other uh, other areas of the world, particularly in Japan, Korea, and United States. Then when we go to the expected results, which are the, in other words, the benefits that will be provided by the initiative, it's an accelerated development. We need that in order to cope the, the challenges from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, the green transition. So an accelerated development, a rapid design, serving so strategic innovation markets. So a very rapid diffusion between knowledge, between different innovation markets, closing the materials loop towards a circular, safe and sustainable society, and maximize the overall impact of all the funding and financing levels in Europe. So these are the benefits that the that that will be provided. You can call it like the secondary outcomes if you like, but these are the benefits. So next slide please. So this is again the AIM 2030 objectives. So in the gray box you have the operational objectives and these are the expected outputs that I discussed before. In the middle you have the specific objectives which are the expected results that I also discussed before, and then comes the general objectives, which is the expected impact. The expected impact are higher level, if you like. So it's a boost industrial competitiveness. It's to reinforce EU sovereignty, global leadership, strategic autonomy in key areas, ensuring compatibility with EU values, establish and strengthen sustainable, resilient and circular advanced materials value chain, supported the Green Deal and contribute to the digital age through smarter advanced materials and data. And this is the object is really focused address the planet, the people and prosperity. So it's the combination of these three things that makes things, things happen in an inclusive way. So next slide, please. We have a list of actions and we have divided these actions into core actions, collaborative actions, data actions, and uh, uh, regulations and policies. 
So in the different fields, I will not go through the, all this list here. I will just go through, I think I take the core right now and some, some others. So in the core, the actions is to set up tools that encompass design, manufacturing, circularity, and testing principles for fast and scalable advancement test development, which is replicable from one innovation market to another. Very important. Reduce and substitute critical raw materials, create and promote sustainable material sourcing, develop and implement recycling technologies, business models, and markets for closing the advanced material circular value chain. The collaboration, I will highlight that in the next slide. So I go to the data. The data is about building a common data space to ensure a true material centric partnership across the material stakeholders ecosystems and to enable and ensure a guaranteed product and service digitalization along value chains based on materials transparency and traceability. When it comes to the policy and regulations, support the deployment of the sustainable by design framework, contribute to common understanding regarding the health, safety, and sustainability issue, etc. So you will get this slide later. So I would like to go to the next slide now. Just to say some few words about the part in the need of the collaboration. The key collaboration actions is to engage and coordinate the European Commission, the member states, the industry, research and citizens to leverage collaboratively the interplay between advanced materials, digital technologies, technologies and circular strategies, funding and investments, and to facilitate innovation uptake and to foster the presence of the entire value chain in innovation development programs. These are just highlight the collaborative actions. So. If you take the next slide, which I think is really important now, is that we believe that it has to be a European partnership in order to address these things. It's only a partnership that is long lasting and coordinated that will have the chance to live up to the challenge and bring predictability to the European advanced materials value chain stakeholders. And we know that by pooling resources, by pooling Europe's resources and knowledge, we know that we can accelerate development, industrialization, and deployment of strategic technologies. So we believe that there is a need for a partnership. We believe that there is no really good existing instrument for that today. So it's a new kind of European partnership, and we are happy to discuss that more later. So let me have the next slide, please. So we know that the European he and research and innovation landscape is rather, let's say, busy. I wouldn't say complicated, but busy. And we have tried here just to illustrate how busy it is. And this is just a fraction of the different big initiatives that exist today. And it's very difficult to have a good overview, of course, about this. And we envision that the Advancement Health Initiative is not just another one. It is the initiative that will allow a better kind of articulation between the different initiatives. We all need the sectorial initiatives. We need the things for better batteries or uh, hydrogen, etc. We need all these, but we also need the cross-cutting initiative, which is the advancement health initiative, in order to secure that there is a fast diffusion of innovation between different other initiatives. So it's really a part of it. In the next slide, we try to reduce it and make it a little bit more clear how we believe this could happen. So if I have the next slide, please. So here you see Amy in the middle there as, an, as a horizontal box. And in the bottom, we have the cross enablers, the, uh, the, the P4P, the, the bio-based economy, the EIT raw materials made in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And then to the right hand, you have what is happening in the member states. Peter mentioned the Aeronet and specifically the materials Aeronet. We also have the Vanguard initiative and there are other initiatives that happens in the member states. We have in France, we have in Germany, we have in different countries, a lot of things happening among the materials. So, and then we have the customers and the customers are these sectorial things. It is, for instance, the innovation, the EIT Health, the Innovation Health Initiative, it is the uh, the energy initiatives with batteries, hydrogen, etc. It is the mobility and it's uh, the construction, etc. So these are the customers. So we believe AMA 2030 is positioned in between as an interfacial agent, if you like, 
And we don't want to box it because as soon as you box it, you get everything kind of closed and things are inside and some things are outside. We are an integrator, a facilitator, if you like, that will allow a much higher value to be coming out of the different initiative that already happens. So next slide, please. I'm ready. So now, if you would like to have any questions, I would like to ask you to use this slider, as Jürgen said before, and then I leave the word back to you, Jürgen, I think, right? Thank you, Lars. Thank you for this comprehensive overview and for sharing all the thinking going on in this, in this initiative. And as to, this is not set in stone, this is really current thinking where you are. Therefore, now is the opportunity to ask questions via Slido. I saw already one question from Spain. Now I'm wondering whether, uh, Martina, can you put the Slido questions here on the screen? Okay. Why only new energies? Also, existing ones need new or better materials. Hmm, that's an interesting one. <laughs> We're in the middle of the Green Deal debate. Um, then we have a question. Will this initiative also deal with nanomaterials and nanotechnologies? Uh, oh, there's a lot coming. Maybe we start with these two questions. Lars, are you ready? Right. And then others may ask sure. as well. Sure. Let's start with the, with the I mean, there, there is no, I mean, everything is included there. So it's not only new energies, of course not, but there are new ways to, to actually secure that we do have a new supply in Europe. And we need, of course, innovation for that. And materials are the, the mother of innovation for that. So it is included, of course. And then when it comes to about the nanomaterials and nanotechnology, for sure, I mean, advanced materials, it's, the definition is principally that that you an advanced material is a material that you do something with in order to enhance its functionality. Let's call it like that. So nanomaterials and nanotechnologies is of course an integral part of that or a subset of that, if you like. What comes the functionality with nanomaterials and nanotechnology is of course due to the scaling effects and the quantum effects, etc. But it is a way, so it is really included. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Lars, for this clarification. Very important. Now I see plenty of other questions. And um, if you allow me, Lars, I put you on the grill until 11 o'clock, but then, because <laughs> I see some questions already maybe looking into the next sessions. Um, the next question, which I have, but I leave it to you, Lars, how much you would like to go into it, because it will also be for the next session with Gerhard Goldbeck. Who will care about the governance of EU data, of the EU data space, data from industry, national projects? Maybe first thinking, but if you would like to refer to Gerhard Goldberg later on, feel free. And the other one is also, where do you see more member states cooperating with you and, and other member states? So since you refer about the cooperation, is there a kind of shared responsibility? So certain focus on this, others focus on that, or how do you see this? Okay, let, let's take this with the, uh, where did it go? About the, um, and the in, interrelation between member states, right? So can, can you go back? Because I think it was a loss now. Yeah, can we go back to this initiative? Okay, yes, thank you. The implementation. Uh, no, it was not. Uh, wait, so the uh, question uh, is, uh, the, uh, where more member states the... cooperating with EU and member states, right? So I think, as we said, as I tried to indicate in my presentation is that we are looking on that there is no really good existing uh, instrument today. So we, we, we believe uh, that we need to develop uh, something more new one, uh, really uh, partnership kind of program with new kind of, let's call it components or ingredients, if you like. And here, of course, shared responsibilities, I think is very important. And one thing that I maybe should emphasize is that a very important aspect of this is to get our industries involved, because it is the industries that will actually develop the product that will make Europe good again. So the, the amount of innovation is the materials, but it is the products in the end that are the key here. So we need more industries. So it's not only about a kind of a cooperation between EU and member states, it's also with industry. And that's why it's so inclusive 
So we need industries, but we also need a public because we should develop things that are useful for the public and for the planet, of course. So I think we, we will see more. We cannot be definite here. There is a need to discuss this much more, but surely a shared responsibility. And again, I would like to emphasize this about not trying to put a border around things and say something is inside and something is outside because then we polarize. This is not about polarization. It is to integration. So we I think we need to develop this. Yeah. Last, I see a very popular question, but I think Peter whispered me, maybe he wants to take it. The implementation of this new type of partnership, will it take place during Horizon Europe or the next framework program? <laughs> Just think a bit more to address to us. Over to you, Peter. <laughs> thank you, thank you, and thank, uh, thank you, Frederick, for, for putting this question. Um, I think that there were indeed two slides which are particularly important in, in last presentation, the one with the outcomes and results and the one on a possible tool. So um, there is nothing decided. Uh, we are currently exploring as part of the strategic programming process for which um, there is an open public consultation and it would be great if you haven't done it yet, look at it and, and give us your feedback. Um, we are also looking at the next generation of partnerships, so new partnerships under Horizon Europe. So uh, in the period 25, 2025 to 2027. Um, and um, nothing is decided, we are exploring. Uh, so um, uh, I, I know that and I think there are good arguments for a possible partnership, but um, the decision will take uh, place at the best uh, at the end of this year uh, when uh, we're finalizing the strategic plan. But the idea is if we go for a partnership, it should be um, uh, under Horizon Europe. But let me add also that um, I see this uh, possible partnership only as one of the tools to implement this and realize uh, this ambitious agenda. It cannot be that um, we lay down and uh, think all is done uh, if we have this partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I see, Lars, that your presentation has triggered many questions, much more than <laughs> I expected. It's actually great. That is fantastic. Uh, if okay for you, I think the question on the data space, I would leave it to Gerhard Goldberg because yes. there are plenty of other mm -hmm. questions coming up. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's one on uh, the low tiers and the high tiers. Maybe you have some thinking, but you showed a slide. Uh, and there may be some other questions. And Martina, if you can move them a little bit up, the other questions, because I'm looking up. So maybe you take first the question about low and high TL. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, as I showed in my presentation that our core is between TRL 3 to 8, right? But we do not exclude because we believe that it's really the, the things we do in our laboratories today, which are kind of minus infinity for like when it comes to TRL levels, are needed in the future, but not maybe immediately because they cannot jump over all the innovation cycle. In, in like 20 seconds. So there is a need to have a full kind of comprehensive discussion or projects, if like, in the end, later on, that covers all the difference from blue sky research to the market. But what we would like to do is to try to connect the blue sky research with the market. So you actually do blue sky research for something that could be of particular importance for the market when it will be ready, if we take time, of course. So, but it's very important to have the blue sky research because that is the model of innovation. That is the model for inventions. So there is a need for that, for sure. Thank you, Lars. I think also good said to, if you allow me to come that we need this integrated approach. If we go for low trail, where do we go afterwards? It's this exactly. market pull idea also mentioned in the manifesto. Uh, there is another question. Which definition for advanced materials will be used to differentiate the partnership from other initiatives? Oh, <laughs> okay. You already answered about nanomaterials and nanotechnology. Right. But maybe you have <laughs> other ideas. Well, I, I mean, advanced materials is, I mean, you can, it's generally material that is specifically engined or to exhibit a novel or outstanding property. I mean, that, that is the definition, so to say. So it's not something you just pick up 
and then you can use it directly. Then it's not an advanced material. So, and it is this kind of valorization of the material, the process of that, that makes it to become an advanced material. And it is needed. And we, as, as I said before, we don't want to have our partnership as a, as a singular partnership or a singular entity or project that is, um, how can I do it? Co competing with other initiatives. We are an inclusive agent that will facilitate the interaction between the different existing and new, more silo oriented or vertically oriented programs that will appear in the future. So there is a need to have the integration. Of course, we will take care about supporting development of the things where we see a big commonality. So we would like to include what others are doing and not, not make it once more or so, but really to be complementary. And by being complementary and having a good insight of what is happening, we will be able to define different projects, if you like, or programs inside the initiative that will develop common, common, common strategies or common uh, in, inventions that can be used in many different innovation markets very, very quickly to accelerate the deployment. So we should be uh, seen as a partner together with the other ones. So not, not a singular exclusive thing. I mean, really an integrator. Okay. Uh, oh, that's a nice one here. <laughs> Sorry that I'm smiling, but that's a good one. ME is ambitious and becoming the coordinating board between all materials initiative. So that's a bit an assumption this question. What measures are in place so it is not seen as a ruling body? I think that's a good one, Lars. Yeah, I mean, first of all, everything is about inclusiveness. We would like everyone to be included, so we don't want to be like a, like a, what they say, as a ruling body over something. It's really an inclusive thing that everyone is asked to participate, and we want everyone to participate. And it's not about putting up rules, so it's not like a, like a federated with with a governing board that they tell people what they should do. It's really about an inclusive thing and to develop the initiatives and the coordination activities that will actually make true coordination in a in a double beneficial way benefit for the for Europe of course and also benefit for the partner that participates. So we would like to avoid everything that is about ruling, but we would like to develop an inclusive participatory program with all the other initiatives as well. Of course this is very ambitious to try to have an overview of what is happening in Europe. We do believe that maybe it will be impossible to have a full overview, but to have at least a part overview would help innovation and to accelerate innovation to go into the into the innovation markets. Thank you, Lars. If I make, if you allow me to make a parallel, we have, for instance, a partnership mm -hmm. on artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. robotics, and data. This is not a ruling a partnership across other partnerships. They're integrated. They have to reach out to many user communities who who need artificial intelligence. So there's a strong cooperation. And I saw the slide you were showing. So, uh, and and I is actually an interesting example also in the light of the remarks made by Peter. Uh, there is one question. I think you have not to answer everything. That's a tricky one. What are the instruments, actions to achieve the specific goals? What is the funding? Well, the funding is a bit more maybe for <laughs> for me, and I, that might be a bit early days. But uh, right. do you have any ideas about instruments, actions to achieve the specific goals? You mentioned partnership. No, I think this 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 is this is part of the strategic agenda that we are working on now, and it's it's one of the working groups in the strategic agenda that is actually taking or trying to develop or, or, or suggest different kind of instrument actions so we can achieve the specific, the, the specific goals. Um, so, I mean, every input that we can get is important. So I, maybe I forgot to say that you're all very welcome to be engaged, to just go to amy2030.eu and then you can send in, uh, you can you can reach out to the web page and then there is a uh, possibility to contact by email and then you will be part of the working groups and then you 
will be able to contribute to this. I mean, again, this is an inclusive thing. We don't want to rule anything out. Yeah. And it's very difficult at this stage to say what are the specific instruments, of course. We are developing our suggestions in the strategic agenda that will be ready by end of February. So we are working very hard on that. And uh, there are a lot of people working on these things. And I think the funding question is a bit for the Commission, but a bit early days. <laughs> First yeah, of all, we need yeah. to look at the content. Um, I'm conscious about timing, but if okay for you, I keep going for five minutes and then I go to the mm -hmm. next session because mm -hmm. I see the big interest and they're interesting questions. What about necessary breakthrough in novel materials like quantum materials with low TL? Mm -hmm. There's a question I think about I addressed that or yeah. all read it right by by, yeah. by the, the blue sky is very, very important, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we have then a question if you want to focus on the products, why focusing on TL three to eight? How do you want to cover the valley of deaths? Mm. Okay. I think by having a very closely connection to the industrial players, it the, the it is a necessity to have that right that's what i emphasized at the, in the beginning that industry must be on board because the the let if you call it the program or the the strategic ideas in the materials initiative should be kind of translated and become part of the industry's own roadmaps and by having this kind of inclusive thinking then there will be a possibility to very quickly go from a low TRL to high TRL and into the innovation market and into the real market. And this is why it's maybe not a, a rocket science how to how to how to cross the value of death, but there is a, we need a new way to avoid that we have, that we come into this value of death. And the only way to do that is to have a very inclusive and strong connection to the let's go the end market the users the citizens but also the industries and the processing technologies that will actually make this happen thank you Lars I take now the last question but there are uh, okay I take two questions but then I think we finish the one is the sustainable access to metals and minerals is crucial for the Amy 2030 strategy we would like to see raw materials and advanced materials jointly addressed. Okay, that's more a statement than a question. So, uh, then I'll ask if you would like to make a comment on this. And then, how do you expect to close materials loops, da 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 da, and circular strategies without feeding the circle with access and extract of metals and minerals, in particular critical raw materials? Well, Peter Drell mentioned already the critical raw materials act. It's a bit looking into the scope. Yeah. If you have any comments at this stage, yeah. I mean, maybe the comment is that we we do not particularly focus on on. I mean, we, we see ourselves as an enabler, and we see that the innovations or the inventions that are done in the different innovation markets will address critical raw materials, and it would address uh, metals and minerals as well, including also how to maybe substitute some of these to very novel ways of actually making substitutes that are not worse than but better instead and better in all dimensions because some of the critical raw materials are not very sustainable as we know and there is a of course a, 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 not an infinite resource of that so we need to increase the uh, the circular value chains in these domains I mean, and here we we are not unique. I mean, we would like to work very much, very closely together with, it's, for instance, the ET raw materials and other things in this domain. Right. Good. Uh, thank you very much, Lars. And I think I would like to come now to an end to the session. Uh, I mm -hmm. clearly see an interest of Era Min colleague with plenty of questions. Uh, but I think this clearly shows we have to continue the discussions. Uh, so many thanks for last for this. The questions are well noted. There's a possibility to come back to this. I will also explain at the end of the workshop what would be the follow up, what we intend to do. Um, I would like to move on now to the next session. And this is, I'm very happy to see Gerhard Goldberg, who is joining us. You are the chair of the working group focusing on materials digitization but you're not only the chair <laughs> i think you stand for many other things um 
First of all, I think you are the Executive Secretary of the European Materials Modeling Council, a uh, very important one. Uh, you're well known, I think I would say, in the world of modeling, characterization and materials. And uh, I was actually delighted to see you have a, what, a, what a background in physics, theoretical physics, polymer physics, there's quite a lot. So over to you, Gerhard, and please take us through your slides and then we have questions via Slido and statements in the chat, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jürgen, for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, yeah, the Materials uh, Digitalization Working Group, uh, you know, led by, by me and by the EMMC community, really representing materials modeling and digitalization, has brought together uh, ve very uh, uh, many stakeholders here. And um, we've elaborated first the, 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 the roadmap that was in draft and now is, is finalized. And so I start uh, right with that and then go and connect uh, with what uh, Lars has been saying about uh, ME 2030 in, in, in general and, and more widely and how it fits into uh, AMI 2030 overall. Um, so um, what we came up with is this, um, this, this circular, uh, um, uh, a diagram here of activities. If you want to develop and use materials, you know, you, you always encounter, um, you need to have new knowledge, I, you need to generate data from um, characterization, from modeling, but also in, in, in the use case in, in LCA and so on. And um, that new data uh, needs to be uh, digitalized and integrated. Uh, um, and, and there we support that with the data documentation. So that's already the second uh, box here. Uh, uh, and, and part of that circular of activities where we need to make um, the data better described so that they can be better used, reused and valorized and also be ready for uh, the opportunities of um, artificial intelligence for semantic technologies, semantic web, and so on. So uh, this is a very important uh, activity um, that is described in the roadmap. And then um, where are these data now? We need, need to manage the data better, the access to the data, the exchange of the data, the traceability in a data space, uh, which is a federated data space with trusted data exchange and access. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it's all about in the end exploitation and better valorization of the data um, so we can create more value uh, on the basis that we have now built uh, with the other in the other boxes using digital and AI technologies, uh, better exploration and also curation of the data. So if we go to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, here we see um, again, the problems and needs, and I, I just put some boxes around where, you know, we can leverage digital methodologies and tools. We have the increased complexity, which means that uh, we, we can use digital um, to, to make sense of, you know, what, uh, what we have much, much better. Uh, we can integrate uh, or overcome fragmentation. Um, by establishing a common language, by establishing integrative uh, technologies um, from digital, and of course, using that and using the digital and model based design and so on, uh, supports the leadership and the competitiveness of, uh, of industry. Only through information uh, can we overcome linear value chains and their, their uh, vulnerabilities and, and make uh, a better integration. Uh, across those stakeholders, and uh, and of course it it highlights new solutions uh, as as needs um, alignment integration. We need investment as well, of course, to make this all happen, and um, we need to bring the digital transition to materials. Right, digital transition does not happen somewhere out there. It needs to be brought into the fields. So this is what th this section is about, um, and that supports then a better resource efficiency and, of course, by uh, as the term says, knowledge sharing. In the next slide, please. Um, I, I just want to highlight one of the um, <clears throat> areas where we have a lack of integration 
and a lack of of, uh, of digitalization, making use of opportunities, um, can can really transform here uh, how we deal with materials. Um, this is what what I'm showing here is the uh, the materials R and D data and digital tools here at at the bottom, uh, and then the gray in the gray. Um, the uh, areas of manufacturing, um, digitalization, and data spaces. So at the top, you have uh, the product requirements, design, and development, manufacturing, use, and end of life of, of products, which then require the materials. So they will use available materials uh, that somehow are developed in the uh, materials R&D um, field. Right, but at, at the moment, we then have often a disconnect of that um, management uh, where we bring the new materials in, but then lack the, 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 the tracing of the materials information and, uh, and information management of materials throughout the whole system so that at the end of life, you know, we often have then uh, a worry about, okay, what is this material? What are we going to do with it? So it's a lack of circularity supported um, in, in the current way of doing things. Uh, then if we go to the next slide, um, we, we see how we want to address this. Um, so digitalization uh, leverages, um, can be leveraged to support the outputs and results of AMI 2030. And uh, the, we have then uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the game changers. Um, so we can exploit existing and, uh, and, and generate new data with harmonized digitalized technology. So game changes for modeling, characterization, production, and testing technologies, as well as semantic technologies and artificial intelligence. And then the next slide, uh, we can support a systematic collaboration by uh, developing and disseminating a common documentation language and ontology for data exchange and knowledge management. So that supports material standards and regulations as well. And then the common toolbox is the material data space uh, using the distributed data re repositories with trusted data management. Uh, so the, the, this is again how uh, this, um, these, these activities then form uh, this virtuous circle along the whole value chain to support the expected outputs and results. The next slide. Um, we have an, a number of, of actions um, uh, in, in that, that we propose here in, in AMI 2030. Here are the one, and they, they were shown already um, by Lars. Here are the ones that are in focus on materials uh, digitalization. And I will in particular um, uh, um, comment a little bit on, on this on the last two, but also, you know, uh, of course, setting up tools uh, is, is important and, uh, uh, and and of course, promoting upskilling and reskilling is also extremely important, especially to bring the digital skills uh, into uh, and, and use them in, in the material space. Um, so the, the ones I want to comment on here in, in more detail are, <clears throat> are the last two. So we will uh, pick them up in the next two slides. Uh, yeah, so this is the first one um, with a bit more detail, the uh, building a common data space, ensuring a true material centric partnership across the material stakeholder ecosystem with materials data and information at the core. Uh, and of course, it um, goes across all of the working groups, but with a focus here on the digital aspects. Um, this is a game changer uh, for collaboration, overcoming these barriers that are also showed in the, in the, in, in the graphic earlier. Uh, the barriers between <clears throat> the, the different communities in terms of chemicals, processing materials, manufacturing process along the value chain and across industry. The aspect is that it's a distributed data repository uh, with trusted data management ex and exchange overcoming the fragmentation. Um, and we need to make sure <clears throat> that the data are meaningful, reliable, trusted, and fair. And <clears throat> also, if we want to um, implement uh, important regulations and standards, such as product passports, materials passports, this can only be done 
if we have these types of common spaces and common languages and semantics um, as a background. And the next slide is now um, uh, an example of a more specific action uh, around the uh, product and service digitalization, which is an ongoing um, trend, which is um, which is one of the digital transformation activities that we need to um, guarantee that can be done along the value chain based on materials transparency and traceability. Um, if I have a, a product and offer a product and service to consumers, I need to, uh, you know, consumers also expect that transparency and expect to know what is uh, what is available. Also, uh, companies would like to um, offer new services and new opportunities based on materials data. So the availability of relevant materials data for product innovation and services needs to be ensured. Uh, and, uh, this enables new services and business models as well based on the richer materials data, for example, uh, also in the closing the loop decisions. Yeah. So what uh, what new opportunities are there um, uh, for for um, for reuse of such materials, for example, creating also new business models around that. And then, as, as I mentioned already, the transparency of the information to the consumer. These are just some of the aspects here. And then uh, finally, I would like to go to the next uh, slide, which is really shows um, kind of the vision of um, the common materials data space, um, again, uh, the, the change from the slide where we have just like an input of materials into uh, the manufacturing product life cycle at some stage and then uh, not enough of a, of a connection throughout the value chain here we we can um, can really have a very synergistic effect between uh, the manufacturing data spaces and and and, and, the, and the, the life cycle and then the materials development as well as use and management uh, supported by by product service um, and materials digitalization. So, yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. Then, yeah, that will go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gerhard, for giving this overview and also sharing all the insights in the current work going on in this working group very ambitious agenda indeed. I see we have further participants, but <laughs> this interest is growing. We are now up to 310. So it's good that we show again the Slido and, and, and how you can encode and ask any questions. Um, what are the questions coming up? Okay, we have this big question, who will care about the governance of the EU data space? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, then we have a question about after globalization, delocalization, Europe needs a rebuilding of production of advanced materials in the territory. I leave it to you whether you would like to take it. Yeah, maybe we start with first with the governance of the EU data space, which is a very complex one. Yeah. Yeah, it it, it is, and of course, you know, it, it goes um, beyond just the uh, you know the the, the 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 digitalization. I mean, it's it's really the governance or um, here governance of materials. Data means, you know, how how do you how do we govern and govern the, our, our our materials and the information about them, uh, and of course uh, there are two aspects. One is the there is of course a lot of regulation, a lot of uh, um, um, uh, um, legislation uh, coming coming on, on online about uh, data governance, and uh, the fields have to be ready for for this, right? So uh, this can only be uh, implemented and we can ensure proper governance of data if we govern the data in the field. That means uh, how do we describe the data? How do we even know what the data is? Um, how can I ensure that someone, um, you know, has the security of the data? Of course, using we can use uh, and, and we will integrate the relevant technologies for that as well. You know, um, uh, Web 3.0 semantic uh, web uh, um, blockchain technologies and so on can be implemented. But at the same time, um, for example, 
at the moment it's it's like I would have to look at the data to even know what the data are yeah but now I, I don't want you to look at the data yeah so I, I need to have something to tell you what what is in there right and and this is where the field has to organize only the field can uh, document the data in a way that governance can even be um, implemented properly and this is I, I think what the focus is here uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the overall digital uh, developments, the overall governance developments can be properly implemented and um, and also utilized in, a, in the material space. Thank you. Then there is a next question, again, a bit linked to this idea of a common material startup space. How to connect such an idea and similar related projects with parallel national initiatives? Yes, very good question. Um, uh, there is very much a, a connection with, uh, with with national initiatives, um, and um, I see a I see a big synergy here. Um, at the same time, also, um, you know, as we talked earlier about the governance, we're dealing with a global world where we need to make sure that um, we, we replicate these um, great initiatives uh, across Europe um, and, and also build then a system that is, can be used by industry um, on, a, on a European and a, and a global scale. So uh, connecting with the national in initiatives and uh, again, use, as, as Lars said, working in an inclusive way with all of the stakeholders um, is extremely important here. Okay, uh, then I see the next question. Maybe one comment on this question. I think in the work program 2023-2024, under the cluster Digital Industry and Space, there's also a complementary support action proposed. The call is very open. I will mention it at the end of the workshop. So it's not something which we can more or less answer <laughs> in, in a day. So there is funding already foreseen for CSA in this regard. But be, could we maybe, uh, Gerhard, could you shed some light on this? Is there a repetition actually of all the data comments work which is already done by the EAMC? That's an interesting one. <laughs> Yeah, well, all I can say is I, I wish the EMMC and, and the work we have done so far, you know, was uh, um, was so all encompassing that it would that everything is already done, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I think we have had great um, examples of of data commons work in funded projects for sure. This is laid uh, very very important foundations. Uh, for what uh, AMI 2030 wants to wants to achieve now, which is a much bigger reach, more really across not not just some examples uh, of of how things can be done, but but really do the hard work of all of the implementations across all of you know many different uh, materials uh, across the value chain. So a huge amount of work to be done. Um, so no no danger of repetition for sure. Uh, the um, the, shall I go on to the link to the EOSC? Yes, please go ahead. To the, I mean, the, the EOSC uh, uh, semantic uh, interoperability framework, for example, is um, is I, I see that as an extremely uh, useful uh, blue, blueprint, right? Um, and um, what, what I would say is to, to EOSC is also what I said to, 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 to other things. So, so there is the data communities, right, that give us extremely good blueprints, extremely good information about, you know, how should we do things. And we are definitely following these, these types of things. But we also have to then bring all of the materials communities together and actually do it. We have to implement um, uh, such, uh, such frameworks. Uh, and, and so, um, this is not, not a repetition at all. Again, this is a, a, a lot of work that needs to be done to make it really happen in, in the materials field. Okay, then I turn to the next questions, which I see here on the screen. First is, uh, after globalization, delocalization, Europe needs a rebuilding of production of advanced materials in its territory. How does AMI 2030 rank such a value chain? It's a bit broader, but 
Gerhard, yeah. if you would like to have any insights on this, that would be good. Then there is another one. What could we expect from artificial intelligence as a game changer for the materials digitalization? Yeah, the, the, the first one I will comment briefly, maybe Jose or, uh, later on can also um, also comment on that. Uh, um, um, it, you know, of course, production is is is, is extremely important here. Um, and um, what, what I would say is that, you know, digital technologies are how we, you know, where, where Europe has a, a leadership, right? Um, as as uh, I think was, was also mentioned earlier, you know, where is European Europe still lead, leader, and how can we bring uh, you know production in, into into Europe? And this is um, by combining our leaderships in um, materials, digital, and product uh, digital technologies uh, to make it actually happen. In terms of the artificial intelligence. Um, Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing a huge, uh, huge opportunity and huge advance um, um, in artificial intelligence for the use of, uh, you know, the product design, but also in terms of um, uh, maintenance of uh, and, 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 and so on. So where we collect a lot of data um, that that can where we can, and therefore we can also then use these technologies um, at the same time. Uh, it's often said there is no art AI without, without IA, so uh, we need the information architecture, i.e. also the data documentation and semantic technologies, in order to be able to use artificial intelligence to the best possible extent. Yeah. Uh, without data that are well organized, artificial intelligence is extremely uh, well can can go very wrong as well right and it can give, give you the wrong things but we are seeing it as a, as a big game changer okay then there's a very practical but very relevant question how is rpr product protection ensured in the open transparent data space especially when it comes to the manufacturing phase uh, so again, I, I would first say, yeah, I mean, obviously IPR protection is very important. Um, the data space uh, openness and transparency is um, it's it's more transparent than open. Yeah. So so this is this is the, a, a key point. Uh, so um, and again, it, it, it very much ties into. Uh, describing what the data is. Yeah. So when I have IPR uh, and, and I want to exchange and trade, I want to tell my trading partner, okay, what is what 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 is in the box? Yeah. Uh, so I, I I need to have the labels on the box properly done uh, to uh, to enable trade and still protect my 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 IP. And and so this when I have that, then I can use technologies um, to support like blockchain and so on, yeah, to uh, sovereignty technologies to support the, the, the IPR um, uh, and still have transparency. Yeah. So 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 one one answer is oh I make everything open. No, no, uh, the the other answer is the right level of transparency that will still enable um, you know IPR protection using a number of um, you know well-known technologies. Is it really material centric or data centric? It's um, okay. Uh, so, so material centric. Um, I think we what what we use we use the, the term material centric in the sense that um, a, a little bit is a balance to. Um, to, to, to products. Yeah, what, our world, we live in a world of systems. Yeah? The product is a system, um, but then in the end, an advanced material in particular is a system in itself, right? Um, so we can only manage this world if we have um, sufficient emphasis on both these types of systemic centers. So the, the product and also the material. Um, I would say that uh, just like in, in, in green and digital transformation, data centric is da da data is the uh, the means, right? Uh, but we need to describe is the means for information and of these systems. Yeah. 
yeah and and and, and so we need to make the data work uh, for us yeah for the citizen for the material uh, in the product uh, and, and 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 so that that's why um, it's really in the end I think from a from a citizen perspective okay I want it to be um, material centric but in in but uh, I want to have all of the information I want to need I need to know yeah So bear with us. There's, okay, there's a new movement towards Web 0.3. Are the two relevant for this and the blockchain technology? Something new, quite revolutionary and occupying very much a digital world. Is this relevant for the strategic materials agenda? How you see this? Then there's more a question coming from the EIT raw material. So I see there's a big interest from this EIT, <laughs> uh, if you have an answer. And then there's an interesting one from Elisa Molinari. Computational markets research codes are essential and leading in the EU. Oh, now it disappeared. Uh, can we put, ah, yeah. Uh, but hardly present here. How will they be integrated? Uh, and there's a hint given. Um, Over to you, Gerhard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think the first one, I, I talked quite a lot about uh, about blockchain, so um, definitely, definitely important. Web 3.0. What does it mean? It means semantic web, right? Semantic technologies. It, it means actually all of the things that I mentioned before. Yeah. So, so this can only work uh, in in our field, and we can make it to work, and we want to make it to work by having um, all of the information uh, ready in this way. Yeah? So um, a lot of the web and all towards web 3.0 is driven by um, you know, uh, schema.org, metadata schema, and all of this. And you find this for all sorts of things in the world. Do you find it for materials? No, you don't. Uh, so we need to get ready for these technologies and, 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 and in order to use them. This is what uh, um, what AMI does. Computational materials is very, very much at, at the heart, and I uh, absolutely um, support that EU is leading, but EU is, has uh, the largest uh, companies in the world uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this field, and also the best academic uh, research in this field, and um, the uh, model-based approach and computational materials research is um, one of the core aspects of um, you know, generating data and insights and supporting um, then the use of that uh, in, 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 uh, in, in products. What AMI wants to do is to um, improve the link of, of this into the, into the product design, um, as, as I showed with this parallel spaces that, that provide a, a richer information um, at the point where the products need them and where we need them for decisions. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm. No, I, I think, think raw materials is probably a little bit outside this field. So, I mean, if you want. Okay, but that is definitely something where we need to look into it more in detail. It goes far beyond the working group number one. I understand, Gerhard. Um, there is then most of the decision to efficiently recover materials at EUL are taken in the design phase of a component, the jelly state. Is this going to be tackled here? To recover, uh, yes, uh, the design phase of a component. Uh, to be looked into a bit more in detail. To be looked in, into a bit more. Uh, again, I, I would um, refer back to this, to, to, to the graph of we often lose the information about or lose too much of the information about what these materials really were, right? Um, and, uh, and and so absolutely, yes, this, this is one of the key things that should be tackled here. Okay, and then I take the last question. Can the manufacturer obtain one model process and use to calculate for LCA? Uh, one model process and used to calculate for the life cycle assessment? Um, not sure I really understand, uh, understand the question. The, um, the, the, maybe others can also comment. I, the, the, the point on, on, on LCAs is, is often that 
it's not um, not dynamic enough. Yeah, uh, so it 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 is sort of too much after the fact. So again, a digital and model-based design uh, and model-based approaches will support a more dynamic LCA approach here. And yeah. Okay, good. I think all the questions are well noted. I would suggest we conclude on this session now. And Gerhard, many thanks for having given an insight into the ongoing work. I suppose these questions which have been raised and could not be fully answered will also be taken up in your internal discussions. So I'm happy to welcome now Jose, Jose Carlos Caldera. Good to see you, Jose. Uh, so you're a well known figure, but more in manufacturing, actually. <laughs> uh, so it's good to see you here today. You are a member of the board of directors of the Institute for Systems, Computer Engineering, Technology and Science in Portugal. Uh, briefly, it is the INSEC, CTE. You're also very much engaged in the Manufacture High Level Group, the technology platform. Here you are a member of the High Level Group and also the chairman of its National Regional Technology Platforms Group. And you were facilitating a lot the work in this working group number two, which is about materials production and processing. So, Jose, over to you. Thank you very much, Kieran, uh, for the kind of the introduction. And uh, good morning to your all colleagues and, and uh, happy new year to all of you. So let me briefly introduce you to the work we are developing under the AMI initiative regarding the work group two, which is dealing with the materials production and processing uh, part of the of the chain. Uh, when we were uh, working on the red, on the roadmap, uh, it was clear that we provide the need to bring uh, this this value chain approach. So looking not only at the materials development, but also looking into the the production, the technologies, and the solutions to produce the materials, and then to use them to processing the materials and use them to produce the, the, the components and the products. So, uh, the set of priorities were identified right from the beginning. Uh, that, of course, started by strengthening the collaboration between the different ETPs. That was done right from 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 the initial stages, and and uh, to include in the development or the adaptation of the respective digital and production technologies in advanced materials, components, and 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 products into the R and D projects. Uh, particularly when you, if you want to increase the TRLs and reduce time to market of the complete solutions. And, uh, and, and bringing together the, the, the eco development of the materials, the production and the processing technologies and products for the sustainable uh, solutions. And of course, this was already covered. Uh, it was clearly identified that we need also to develop the, the communication channels to support that, that exchange and sharing between the materials development and the, the production stages. Um, and this is also a, a critical point. I will come back to it later uh, in the presentation. And, 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 and of course, promote the collaboration between the materials developers and the relevant uh, production and digital initiatives. Um, because as we was already mentioned, there are initiatives already ongoing. It's very important to, to articulate this collaboration with those initiatives. So next slide. So we focused on the production, processing, integration, and end of use stages of the, of the, of the innovation uh, of the value chain. And uh, a certain uh, a set a number of, of uh, 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 cross cutting challenges and were already identified during the roadmap stage that are again very, very horizontal, which is of course process optimization, the decarbonization, the mass customization, uh, the zero defect production, of course, the, the, the contribution for the circular economy, and also very important, uh, important uh, the multi materials processing, and of course, it was already. Also, uh, targeting one of the questions, the need to produce, to develop the technologies, if needed, to produce the new materials that will, will be developed. So, next stage, uh, sorry, next, next slide. So, look at, uh, yes, ne yes. So, looking at the problems and, and needs that were already identified, the contribution for these needs, uh, next one, please. Uh, is when we are addressing these new solutions, of course, comes from the pressure to develop new or to improve uh, sustainable production and processing technologies and solutions that are capable of integrating and answering the new requirements on sustainable materials, circularity, CO2 emissions, etc. Et Next one. 
uh, and and of course it was already mentioned uh, the need to to uh, to to have this alignment between the shareholders and the integration of the common goals and shared benefits brings uh, the, this need to collaborate to make collaborative developments uh, between the different value chain stakeholders and also to give some some framework guidance on the materials on the digital and production technologies in advanced materials components and products but also looking into the technological infrastructures the pilot lines the test beds the hubs, so the different uh, uh, infrastructures capable to support this collaboration uh, the auto increased autonomy uh, can have a strong contribution to make more efficient production and product processing uh, technologies. And also, the very important, last but not least, the secure the circular uh, symbiotic value chains. Next one, uh, the need to develop the recycling technologies and the business models and markets to close this 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 advanced materials circular value chain. So next one. And in terms of the, the, the contribution of the, of, the, of the production processing part to the expected results, I just I like highlight three of them. One, next one, please. So the, the collaborative developments uh, of the materials and production and processing technologies will be really a game changer uh, comparing what is the, the, the practice today particularly when it concerns time to market of the, of the new solutions. Uh, if we do it this way, of course, we will, we will have, be able to have much shorter uh, uh, time to market cycles than we have today. The, 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 the circular economy, we, we, need, we clearly need, still need to, to develop new and efficient dismantling and recycling technologies and solutions and business models. And I would like to highlight here the dismantling part where we still have a lot of things to do. And the next one, uh, we need to take full advantage of this horizontal nature of many of these technologies via cross-fertilization and efficient utilization of the existing and the new infrastructures. And of course, to, to ensure an appropriate multi-level public policies and programs that will be able to make them available for, to a large number of companies, sectors, and regions. So we need to, 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 bring, to bring these, these, these technologies, these solutions to a significant number of companies and, and sectors, and this is possible due to their nature. And you just need to, to think about how we can do it and to use the appropriate policies and programs and infrastructure to support that. So next slide, please. So from the different uh, proposed actions that were that this working group is involved, it's similar to what was already mentioned before, I would just like to highlight two of them. Next slide, please. So which is the development of and implement these recycling technologies and business models and markets for closing the advanced materials uh, circular value and to facilitate uh, the, the access of the industry, particularly the SMEs and the mid caps and startups to uh, uh, product innovation services capable of integrating performant, cost-effective and sustainable materials. So we need to support companies into their product uh, innovation uh, uh, stages uh, and help them to bring these materials to their, their products. So can we go to the next slide, please? So here, I'd just like to highlight something that was already be said before by, 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 by Gear. Uh, if I take this picture that you already used, uh, this, this gray box uh, that you presented, and they call it manufacturing product life cycle, actually is a rather uh, a, a comprehensive and extended and somehow complex uh, group of steps uh, um, to ensure re uh, recyclability and reuse of materials. And we need to make sure that we have the, the, the components that we have, the technologies that we have, the machinery, uh, and the systems to, to cover all these stages. So we need to ensure that we have the appropriate technologies to address the entire value chain and all, not only some of the stages. And very important again, and this is my link again to data, is that we need stronger links, uh, including between the materials development, the production and the processing of the materials. And to just give an example, you know, frequently when we, we, we think about the relation, the link between the materials and, and the parts and products where they are used is established and it's, is defined in the processing stage. So we need, there is a lot of, of information that from the materials development that is needed 
to the dis these different stages, but also there is a lot of information and data that is collected or is produced in the different stages of the manufacturing and end of use uh, stages that are very useful for the for the for materials development stage. Next slide, please. That's my my last one. So regarding the, the proposed actions to facilitate the, and, and ensure this access of industry uh, to the product innovation services, I just I'd like to, to highlight that the, the, there is a lot of uh, uh, initiatives and actions already ongoing to support the, the development, the test and validation of advanced materials and the respective production and processing technologies going from the proof of concept until industrial validation. And this is true for the uh, open innovation test beds for the different types of innovation hubs, uh, the digital, the other ones, and also very important here, the role of pilot lines. And we need to ensure this, this dissemination and cross fertilization stage. And in this case, the demonstrators are also playing a very important role, apart from the, the normal the traditional dissemination actions. And also we need to ensure that we have incentives and support for this further exploitation, for this cross fertilization, and here again, for, for example, here the role of the national and regional initiatives and the national regional programs play a very important role. And that's why also one, one reason, not the only one, of course, but where we need also to articulate and to collaborate with the national regional level. So I think this is my last uh, slide. Can we just go to the next one, please? Where we have again the slide of code. So I'm, I'm more than happy to answer your question. Thank you very much for your attention. Jose, many thanks. A particular many thanks for bringing in the manufacturing perspective <clears throat> because for me from a public funder point of view it's very much about materials and manufacturing are two sides of the same coin yeah. uh, and, and this is when we move to the world of circular economies is getting really a fundamental driver so for to do something on materials and not looking into manufacturing would actually be a strategic error so I would be happy now also to get answers. You get already two questions. I see you get already two questions here, but also I hope those who are there have questions to you because this was really an important step after the Materials 2030 manifesto was coming out that you from the manufacturing side, the EIT, the, 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 uh, the technology platform and manufacturing was coming in, joining the work for the materials roadmap uh, in June for the conference in Grenoble. That was for us a very important step. Therefore, you get two questions and I hope you're getting many more. So uh, what are the plans to set, what, there are plans to set up a common manufacturing data space. This exists under Digital Europe, there's the CSA. How to make a link between this manufacturing data space and the discussions here? How do you see it? Well, this was already, uh, let's say, touched also by Gerhard. In my view, uh, these, two, these, two, uh, these two data space, they need to be uh, connected. They don't need to be, they, it's not to merge them, they are two different data spaces because there is information that is not common, but we need to make sure that they are connected. So there is a relation where we, we can, can share and trade information between these two data spaces. That's, that's clear for me. And of course, we have to find ways to bring in these, two, these two initiatives, these two communities together and find clever work, ways of doing it. Now, this, this exchange of data, and this was already touching one of the other questions, the first, the first reason and the first, let's say, the most important aspect is not the, te the technological challenges or the blockchain or whatever. It's first is the need of the stakeholders. You know, companies and the stakeholders, they need to, to see an added value on this exchange of data. And if there is an added value, then the technology can help. And it's clear, we see it today that uh, the companies are already exchanging data, it's not making, as, as Gerhard said, it's not making the data public, it's exchanging data between companies uh, on these fields and also between, between companies, uh, on, on, between manufacturing companies where they are sharing data, but also between manufacturing companies and their suppliers where they are sharing, sh sh sharing data because they see an added value. So I think that it's clear for me, it's clear the advantage for both sides from the manufacturing point of view and from the materials development point of view to exchange this data. So if the, if the added value is there, the technology will, will help to, to, to implement it. So, so regarding, the, if you want me to address the, regarding the, yeah. the, the second question, uh, again, regarding the raw materials. 
uh, raw materials are, are, are critical for, for your sonority. So that's, that's clear. And, and of course, uh, uh, no, no advanced material, to, to make advanced materials, we also need raw materials. So that, that is clear. And, and the, 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 the Critical Raw Materials Act uh, will address this vulnerability. And, uh, but in any case, let's keep in mind that advanced materials is not only raw materials, so it's, it's some other things, but the relation, the, 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 the collaboration between the raw materials and advanced materials is, is clear. Now, as I said, and this is very important for, for let's say, to, to, to reinforce this point, the, key, the question of sovereignty uh, cannot be solved with only the material sovereignty. We need to have the, the sovereignty on the materials and on the necessary production and processing technologies. So because we, we, we can be sovereign on materials, but if you are dependent on others, on the machinery, on the robotics, <laughs> on, on, the, on the digital technologies, of course, our sovereignty is not complete. So we need to ensure sovereignty of the entire value chain. And that's why also this collaboration is very, very important. So I'm pretty sure that the, there is, there are, uh, let's say a set of common goals between the AMI 2030 and with the, the, the raw materials initiatives, including the EIT raw materials, and that we, we make we need to make these links as was, was said before. And uh, at least one, uh, there is one evident area of collaboration, which is of course, education and training where in, in our in our roadmap in, in our in our in our initiative this also it's it's, it's a very important point and where uh, the 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 kick the it raw materials has, is being playing a, an important role thank you jose i turn then to the next question uh, uh, what do you have in mind with pilot lines which technology infrastructures i suppose academic industrial europe is asking early involvement of industry and pilot lines can you shed some light on this well, we, there are the best way to uh, to for these, let's say, more cross sectorial, more horizontal technologies. Um, uh, they they we, when we develop them in the beginning, usually we apply them in, in a certain sector. But they are very cross sectorial, and if they are very cross sectorial, it's important to show to the other sectors the potential of these technologies so that they can be. That we can start this in this cross fertilization effort, and, those, and so to 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 demonstrate this this potential, the pilot lines are very important because they are the best way to show industry and other sectors the potential of a certain technology. So this is for me clear. Now, of course, the involvement of manufacturing of industry, uh, it's it's mainly important. Uh, if you are talking about, let's say, the higher TRLs from, from the middle to, to the end, uh, blue sky research in materials, the blue sky research, of course, the involvement of, of the industry, manufacturing industry is not that, let's say, is not so critical. But when we are doing applied research on materials, when we are developing materials, think on, on, on applications, what we believe, and that's why we are so involved in the initiative, is that we need to speed up this development. It makes sense that we develop the materials with the necessary, again, production technology to produce the materials and also with the processing technologies to use these materials to develop the products or the components. The way we are doing it today, which is basically one phase, at one step at the time, what we know is that it's taking too long. Uh, and, and, and this, we need to speed up this process. And as I said, we, when we are developing the material with the aim of using it in industry, we need, we, we need to develop the material, but we need also to make sure that the, the, the technology to produce them, to produce it and to use it, they are there. In many cases, maybe we, don't, we can use existing technology. So fine, we can speed up the process without developing the, the, any new technologies for producing or for using it. But if they are not there, we need to develop them. So that's why also we are proposing that in these projects, more applied research projects, develop the materials. We, in the same projects, we look also into the necessary uh, production and processing technologies. Thank you. Uh, you started a bit looking already into the next question about efficient dismantling and recycling technologies. They are normally defined as the design phase of the components. This will be needed for a circular economy. That's more statement uh, yeah. and then 
it's a question. I don't know whether you are able to take it up or whether it's more for well, the I, next I can, session I, on I validation say, standardization. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So the, regarding the first one, I can say that uh, we are also in this initiative considering and disclose more to the next working group also, but we are also looking to be safe by the uh, sustainable by design principle. So, of course, a lot of, let's say, the, the potential for for dismantling, for recycling needs to be addressed, should be addressed right from the beginning of of the design phase, uh, that's clear. And um... yeah, I think, and that's a more broader question, but it will come certainly this yeah. afternoon. And I also heard Gerhard Goldbeck saying very clearly, when it comes to life cycle assessment, it needs to be a much more dynamic process. So yeah, this exactly. is indirectly also an answer to this question. So the yeah. manufacturers need also to be aware of it uh, and know what they get, what they should manufacture is actually going along with also testing guidelines and is tested and is safe. Okay, where do you see the role of processing and manufacturing at low TL early stage? Uh, anything on your side? So yeah. I, already, I think I already addressed this one. So okay, yeah. uh, if you're talking about really low TRL levels, uh, the manufacturing side is not so critical. Uh, the, the processing should be, let's say, looking at it, but it's not. It's a, but when we are talking about, let's say, the mid TRLs, let's let's call it like this, uh, the mid TRLs, that then, then we need to bring these communities together. That's I think that's the main change, and that's the main difference compared to what we have we are doing today, and that we need to change. Okay, I see further questions ahead. So, uh, Jose, you are not yet off the hook, <laughs> but we will finish and close here in in, in in five six minutes then as well. So, uh, are there specific actions being designed to address the end of life of materials? So, let's look at beyond recycling. So, uh, I think again, this this can be better addressed by by the next my colleagues that will speak uh, later on. But in any case, uh, I can just give an, an introduction to this, uh, which is, of course, uh, we need to look not only at the recycling part. Also, many what we do with the end of use part, but we should also look into how we can, let's say, reduce this end of use, which means how can we look into design for maintenance uh, to make sure that we are we are able to extend the the life of uh, the, the, the the use time of products, and so uh, there is a there is a, a set of of steps during the the production and also during the design process that is very important for the circularity or to mean or to to minimize the the producing of let's say uh, uh, waste or end of use products so and this needs to be addressed right as it was mentioned right from the design phase and but should look also into the different stages during the pro production and particularly during the processing so when we are producing the 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 the, the, the products and the components to make sure that we facilitate uh, the recycle let's say then the recycling stages because of course a lot of things can 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 hamper or a lot of things can facilitate uh, the, the recycling rate let's put it like this and that depends on the way we design but also on the ways we produce which kind of production technology we use to produce the products and, and the components okay Thank you, Josie. Let me turn to the two other questions which we see here on the screen. That's an interesting one. What are the plans to ensure circularity collection of materials? So we speak about the responsibility of manufacturers when new materials end up in the environment. Are there any plans to discuss this also in this initiative? I'm sure this will be also addressed, but not so far and not by me. So I, I skipped this one, but of course, uh, this I will, I will I will say this will come also with the law the law and the regulations. What we have to do is to make sure that we facilitate this uh, and that we, we do it in a way that we do it uh, the most efficient and effective as possible. Uh, because of course this will this will this is already coming. Uh, it's nothing. It's not new. This is already coming, uh, and this will be increasingly uh, demanded by both. The, the 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 regulators both the governments both the countries but also the the, the citizens uh, the, the 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 consumers and so it's it of course uh, this needs to be addressed by by the manufacturing uh, um, industry and also by the materials uh, producers yeah. 
I suppose some of you are following this debate about replacing the eco design directive by a new regulation focusing on sustainable products and there there will be a regulatory environment coming in this regard therefore all this will be looked but it's a, I think for me a very interesting question because what are the research needs actually to live up to such a manufacturing responsibility we should look into okay what action strategies to lever to leverage the use of bio-based biodegradable materials that's for the for the next working groups <laughs> okay <laughs> okay what about uh is it planned to, to a collaboration with the eit manufacturing how is there any overlap with the made in europe topics how is this going to be tackled okay i yeah. recall the slide shown by Lars Montier is already the beginning but since you are here for the manufacturing side jose go ahead <laughs> yes similar to what happens to the materials in other materials initiatives and also with other digital initiatives of course, this this collaboration with both the Made in Europe, uh, sorry, the Made in Europe and the IT manufacturing will need to be addressed because, of course, if we are looking into uh, manufacturing technologies, uh, we should look at what is already there that can be used uh, by this initiative because we, for sure, uh, AMI 2030 will will be able to use results and developments uh, and technologies and solutions produced uh, under the Made in Europe uh, initiative. And some of them maybe will need to be specifically developed for the, this context of materials, but I'm sure that a lot of them can be used here. So similar to what happens to digital technologies, we are not talking about developing new uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithms. So here it will be mainly users of artificial intelligence technologies and apply them to materials development. And also the, the similar thing, like it was said with the IT uh, raw materials, with the, the IT manufacturing is also the same. We will need to have also a collaboration, strong collaboration with the IT manufacturing, uh, including, uh, as again, education and training for sure, but also in, in some of the, of the uptake measures that can be addressed by IT manufacturing. Okay, thank you very much. Again, cooperation exchange of information what is going on we are, will not look here for a ruling body uh, no, <laughs> governing no. all other partnerships i still i think, I this think question I, yeah i yeah. think the, the key words is as it was says as, as lars said uh, uh, it's it's collaboration and i will put i will put complementarity of of intervention because there is there is for sure a lot of complementarities here thank you okay i see that there are no further questions and this have been quite intensive two hours full of information now uh we have foreseen now a lunch break at 12 o'clock uh and many thanks Jose, for stepping in thank you uh, and thank sharing you. all your insights and uh as i was indicating this is ongoing work uh so we have a lunch break now from 12 to 12 45 many thanks to the current speakers and we will start at 12 45 and then we will continue with uh, Justin van Skepen uh, going to the working group number three, policy support. So things like, I suppose, nano safety, digital product passport, safe and sustainable by design chemicals, materials might come up. So I hope you can remain tuned and we connect at 12.45 and we have still a very important panel at a quarter to two ahead of us. So I think I'm very happy for the speakers and for your great interest today. Let's connect again at 12.45. Thank you very much. Thank you.
would like to resume our discussions. I wait still two minutes and then we start. Good. Good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm looking forward to host now, uh, or to welcome, sorry, a bit slow for after the lunch break, <laughs> Justin. I'm happy to welcome Justin van Skepen, who is from CEFIC. I think your official title is a public affairs manager, but okay, this is a generic title. Yeah, you're also deeply involved in the AMI initiative, uh, but your starting point is really CEFIC for the chemical industries. And we would be interested to hear from you the ongoing work in the work, working group number three, which is has this very broad title, policy. And maybe you can shed some light on it, uh, what you're doing. What are also the questions you might have here actually to the audience? So over to you, Justin, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, very, thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody had a, had a good lunch. And, uh, and ready for the for the next part of this uh, of this session. Um, so uh, my name is indeed Justin van Schepen. Um, I am co-chair of Working Group Three Policy Support, um, together with uh, my colleague uh, Fleming Casse of uh, Dutch Institute RIVM, um, and with our uh, core team member uh, Christian Seitz from uh, from Syscom. Um, <clears throat> so. To start with um, with the priorities identified for this working group um, through the roadmap, um, there are there are four key points uh, which I think is uh, is good to mention. Um, so focus on safe, sustainable by design is, is one of the key initiatives um, to uh, to improve the entire uh, innovation uh, and along the value chain. Um, so promotion and facil facilitation of those measures um, same for harmonization of norms and standards um, with a view to improving uh, the competitiveness of europe um, and then uh, health and safety protocols um, very important um, and also lots of legislation currently ongoing in this respect um, and then um, the, as a fourth point um, education and training. Of course, this is a little bit transversal, um, but of course, there's a there's of course an uh, an important policy element there as well, um, with with many public institutions providing education and training, um, and I think there's um, there's there's many actors involved in there. Um, if we go to the next slide, we um, translated the uh, problems and needs that you might have seen before um, 
more towards um, what is relevant for policy. So we are currently in a context where uh, we face a number of problems um, or there's there's a couple of facts that we need to uh, take into account. Um, so of course, there the 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 diversity of materials that we that we see under advanced materials is quite uh, quite wide. Um, the regulatory approaches um, that are most relevant um, is is still quite in the in the starting phase, uh, especially safe, sustainable by design. Uh, which has just been uh, been released. Um, there, we are facing long times to the market for advanced materials, um, and if we want to move to a more circular value chain, um, we uh, we need to involve many more stakeholders, um, such as the recyclers, um, and. Um, Com comparing different regions in the world, uh, we see that in other regions, uh, including China and the US, uh, high amounts of uh, of investments are going into uh, various clean tax. Um, so um, this is something that we have to cope with and make sure that Europe is um, attractive in terms of investments. Um, and of course, there are many policies that are specific for sectors um, and with such materials diversity uh, um, going into many different sectors, um, this is something to be looked at. Now, to translate that into needs, um, I think it's it's very important um, in, in the coming years to really foster that exchange and dialogue between policymakers, science and manufacturing. Um, there needs to be proper collaboration along the value chains, um, so downstream applications, but also um, the recyclers, as I mentioned. Um, so, so, so having the the circular value chain all uh, being uh, present. Um, there is there is work ongoing. Um, as to improving materials transparency, such as the digital product passport in the in the eco design regulation, um, then uh, what is in the end needed is a coherent uh, EU policy framework um, with strategies towards uh, competitiveness and making sure that this twin green and digital transition is being achieved. Um, and then, um, of course, uh, it would be great to. Uh, make sure there's there's further incentives and, and further innovation activity um, through uh, innovation policy and and funding strategies, um, which find itself of course on various levels. So if we go to the next slide, um, here we see the more uh, more translated towards outputs and results. Um, so um, this SSBD uh, hopefully leads to further joint research and innovation activities um, and through better results um, towards the twin, twin transition. Um, we, um, we hope this helps um, grasping more the benefits of digitalization, um, which would also definitely uh, Go uh, feed into this this digital product passport. Um, so uh, then there's also the transparency of regulations, uh, specifications of norms, um, and um, so the, the 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 good information flow uh, between stakeholders. Um, synergies with all this cooperation uh, between the various levels of government. Um, and all the different initiatives on those levels um, is very important. Um, and then um, this all helps to uh, have more transparency also in global regulatory aspects. Um, so in terms of results uh, that we are aiming for uh, as per the contribution of, of the policy support working group um, is to have accelerated development of safe, sustainable by design uh, materials, uh, advanced materials um, and, the, and the associated technologies. Um, so here 
uh, feeding into the implementation of the SSBD standards um, and uh, also suggesting uh, further uh, possible actions that could support. Um, so rapid design of uh, innovative materials, so making sure that um, design uh, times are, are, are shorter um, and then making sure that these materials also very much serve um, the strategic innovation markets. Um, see the the materials loop needs to be closed uh, towards a more circular uh, society um, so um, that would uh, that would definitely require more uh, collaboration along the value chain as I said um, and those, uh, in terms of policy I think language um, and and same uh, terminology is is, is important um, and that um, this 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 synergies between uh, the different uh, different levels should help the overall impact um, of uh, all funding and financing levels uh, in Europe. So uh, local, regional, uh, national, and and European. In the next slide. Um, we um, have been looking further at uh, the proposed actions uh, that uh, ME 2030 um, wants to take up. Um, and the, the parts in yellow is where uh, Working Group 3 is uh, we, we'll, we'll take the lead uh, and we'll, we'll try and uh, work out further. Um, so here we find again promote upscaling and rescaling closely relates to the point that I mentioned earlier from the roadmap uh, on training and education. Um, so supporting the deployment of the SSBD framework. Um, in, in here, it's very important to uh, improve this common understanding regarding health, safety, and sustainability issues, um, and then also contribute to a policy development um, with the objective to enable uh, development and uptake of safe, sustainable by design um, advanced materials. Um, I think in a, in a more general respect, it's, it's good that towards um, the, the development of the next deliverable of, of AMI 2030, um, in our working group, we discuss um, what are the most relevant policies um, and and work more towards towards a mapping because there is there is so much out there that could potentially be relevant. Um, in the next slide, um, we dive further into these proposed actions. So these three that are um, that this working group is leading on. Um, so for the first uh, policy development um, identification of roadblocks, that's, this is exactly this, this mapping that I just mentioned, um, looking into use cases for the implementation of the digital product passport, um, seeing if there's possibilities for regulatory sandboxes, um, and also supporting uh, fair data. On SSBD, um, here, of course, uh, we're well aware there, there are other uh, actors uh, working on uh, disseminating and uh, making sure this is, uh, this is properly applied um, in, the, in the first phase. Um, so here it's it's important to establish a collaboration, uh, especially with uh, with with uh, looking to Iris um, and and making the link to uh, downstream users, um, and of course to um, engage uh, in use cases um, to 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 help uh, giving that more uh, more of an implementation look. Um, and um, as I, as I mentioned, with all the all the different actors being involved in in training and education, uh, it's important to bring those together and see what is possible to um, to take the next step there. Next slide. Um, that's that's it indeed. Um, thanks thanks very much, and uh, I hope I hope I managed it in time. You managed it in time, <laughs> Justin. <laughs> um, thank you for giving an insight into the ongoing work. I keep underlining this. There are some questions already coming up, but now it's a moment really to ask questions because I think you're setting out quite a broad agenda, uh, legislation, and many things are not totally known, but um, for the background information of many people. This commission uh, will finish its mandate in 2024. 
This means you have a lot of legislation currently in the pipeline. The pipeline means European Parliament and the Council talking about waste, water framework directive, the yeah. revised eco design regulation. So we expect there will be a lot coming also in terms of implementation challenges. Uh, okay, but I see already the first questions here coming up and, and maybe you just in your, you see already maybe, okay, nano safety and the so-called multi-initiative. Is this something on your radar? Yes, yeah, thanks for the question. I'm, I'm sure uh, my, my colleague uh, Fleming uh, would be perhaps in a, an even better position to, to discuss this. Um, but uh, with, with his experience on, on nano safety, um, but indeed um, the nano safety cluster, the, the, the Malta initiative uh, is definitely on our radar. Um, helping in, in, in harmonization, standards, data management, and, and risk governance. Um, I, think, I think the lessons learned there in nano safety uh, are very helpful for, for uh, the current work on advanced materials um, and could definitely be a good learning case towards the further implementation of safe, sustainable by design. Um, and I understood from my colleagues that also uh, AMI is, will be participating in this uh, conference with, uh, with other um, nanomaterials uh, groups uh, and projects um, addressing those challenges in, 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 uh, in risk assessment. Um, okay. So, yes. Okay. There's another one, and DPP stands for Digital Product Passport, for those who do not know. Uh, well, I was a bit referring to it, but is the group currently focused on this or is it a bit too early for you because you need to wait what is coming out of the European institutions? Maybe some, some views you would like to share and if your colleagues who were also mentioned on the slides, sorry that I've not mentioned them at the beginning, uh, if they would like to contribute, they should feel also ready to contribute. Yes, indeed. Um, I would, would definitely invite them. Um, regarding the, the digital product passport, um, yes, I think the, 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 the conceptual idea is there and that's something that, uh, that we can work with. Um, of course, um, the, the legislation on the eco-design for sustainable product regulation is currently still uh, under discussion in Parliament and, and Council. Um, so, um, there, as you see, there are important things coming up, and not only eco design, and not only uh, digital product passport, um, uh, but but the conceptual idea I think is is really helpful um, as a way to communicate uh, certain properties, um, certain origins to the further uh, down the value chain. Um, to recyclers, bringing materials back into uh, into the loop, um, I think that as a, as a conceptual idea is is very helpful. Um, further referring to that question, uh, yes, there are many many other pieces of legislation. Um, that's why I mentioned this this mapping um, because it is not so uh, easy to come up with all the uh, pieces of legislation that are relevant for your advanced materials. Um, as as all the different pieces uh, cover um, from from sourcing up to uh, disposal um, and how to bring them back into the, into the loop. Um, there's all kinds of different pieces of legislation. Um, so that is why um, I think one of the needs is to make sure that there is a coherent uh, policy framework that that uh, supports the further development of advanced materials. Thank you. Before I move to the next question, Justin, I have a bit an ambitious proposal, but you can stop me from doing so because you referred to mapping and we have here an audience still of more than 250 people. And I could imagine there will be many of them who have actually an interest in following a certain part of uh, legislation. I give you a totally different example, uh, the Renewable Energy Directive, which will include a definition of what do we mean by green hydrogen? Mm -hmm. And we all know advanced materials can help quite a lot on the storage of hydrogen. Would it be useful if participants would like to share any any points in this regard with you? Because I think we'll give later on a bit of time. 
I leave it to you. Yeah, I don't sure, want to overwhelm sure. you. I'm I'm more than more than open to uh to any any input from the crowd. Um that that would actually be be the best use of, of these opportunities, right? Okay. So any strong link between advanced materials and the new Green Deal initiatives coming up? Uh, if people have something in their mind or concerned, would be good to share it maybe after this workshop. I will explain why. Okay, but there are a few other questions coming up now. What are the steps you are taking to harmonize the norms and standards of advanced materials in the global market? That's a big one. Uh, there's a... Um... There's 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 quite some some stuff to to be done indeed. Um, I think first of all, getting a clear picture of what is out there, um, because norms and standards uh, they uh, they exist on various levels um, with various organizations, um, both on uh, European level and on an international level. Um, so. In our uh, working group, we have quite some expertise um, of people that have um, been working uh, for, a, for a long time on, uh, on norms and standards. Um, so here, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a matter of mapping, seeing what's out there, where, um, where do we see uh, any obstacles or any clashes, um, where do we see any gaps? And identifying those, um, and I think that is uh, definitely a contribution uh, that that the, that the initiative can bring. Thank you. Okay, there's the next one. As a focus is only in SSBD. What about REACH, the FGAS regulation? Uh, this might have, an, or they would have, also significant impact on materials. You have not to say yes or no, but no, I I I, no. I agree. Um, in the sense that there are many other pieces of legislation that are relevant to uh, to the initiative. Um, why do we look so much at SSBD? Um, is that SSBD is as a concept um, really looking at uh, the way innovation is is being done um, and trying to bring um, the safety and sustainability aspects of the final use all the way back into into the innovation of new materials. Um, so um, as a as a new approach um, and um, as as this new uh, commission recommendation, um, it is it is very interesting to look at, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done to uh, to ensure it is properly uh, implemented. Um, and 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 apply it in in the right way to uh, to really bring the 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 added value. Um, so that's where um, SSBD has big relevance. Um, but further than that, as I mentioned, uh, we do need a mapping to properly uh, see what are uh, the different files that are also relevant. And uh, the person here mentions reach. Yes, um, reaches is, is is going to be revised. Um, we can expect new rules there, um, so that should definitely be looked at. Um, F gases, yes, um, and as you mentioned, also red uh, renewable hydrogen. Um, there are all sorts of applications, all sorts of sectors where advanced materials are going into. Um, so all of those different sectoral policies um, are also of relevance. It is a it is a big it is a big task. Yes, it's a big task, not an easy task, but it might be quite helpful because everybody will have to implement it, and then it, all yeah. of a sudden you get a different movement on sharing data. <laughs> That's at least my experience. All of a sudden you have to share data because you have to implement legislation. All of a sudden you're actually in research going and then to bundle it and to bring it together. There are further questions here. That's a big one. Who will be in the role? Who will be, who have the role to take action on harmonizing policy in Europe globally? Oh, that's a big one. And then the next one is: Will the environmental footprint be a criterion for approval ban of advanced materials? Uh, so, two um, slightly difficult questions. Um, I'm not sure to what extent I can answer them, to, but um, to start with the first one, um, who who will be in the role? 
um, it's, it's, the question is not who will, who will have the lead. Um, no, I think I think what um, what is an in initiative we can do is to um, identify uh, what is really working well, identify what is what are possible obstacles, roadblocks, um, and 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 give an advice there. Um, I think in the end it is the European Union, so including uh commission member states parliament um that have a very important role uh in harmonizing policy and uh making that policy workable um for the uh for the further development of advanced materials um environmental footprinting um Yes, um, I'm aware there's a lot of work ongoing on the further development of uh, life cycle assessments and environmental footprinting um, and um, whether that is a criterion for approval and ban. Um, that is a policy decision that has to be taken by the Commission and the co-legislators. Um, I'm not sure that is a question that I can answer. No, indeed, it's much more a regulatory issue, which goes far beyond the research innovation agenda. Um, where we are grateful here is that also this initiative currently looks at the connection between research needs and upcoming regulatory needs, because they should not be disconnected. This is certainly not a debate for low TLs, but for the industry and for the researchers in high TL, it will be quite hell relevant because here we're also speaking about a competitive advantage of Europe compared to others. Uh, if we move forward, okay. Um, I see there's one question. Okay, do you work with the Joint Research Center to bring the SSBD for advanced materials closer to operationalize and to give feedback to the GIC framework for the SSBD. I can take maybe part of this question, but Justin, I'll let you go first. And then, could it be necessary to classify, standardize, and regulate the use of secondary materials? That's also quite a big question. Um, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, the work on, on, on SSBD, um, the very, very important part of the work is now to um, try and apply it in, in, in good case studies um, and get the information from there and get, get, the, get the input and feedback um, and feed that also back into the Commission and into the GRC. Um, so, um, as, as, as I mentioned, I think there is a, there is a supporting function, uh, but of course we have the, the IRIS initiative that also has an important role here. Um, yeah. Please, uh, Mr. Tj for, for the rest of the, the answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy I, I know to you answer. wanted to say something there as no, well. No, no, but I think the point here, and I would like to avoid any, any misunderstanding. On the 8th of December, the commission issued a recommendation of announcing a testing phase on for a framework on safe and sustainable by design, chemicals and materials. It's addressed to everybody. It's not addressed to this initiative we are talking about. So if the initiative would like to contribute to the work DG Research together with, D with the Joint Research Center is carrying out, this is more than welcome. But I think we should not say that there is an exclusivity of this initiative towards the SSPD framework, not at all. But like I said, there is a connectivity issue, what comes out in terms of policy developments where we expect research innovation to react. It's actually a very good example, like maybe the digital product passport where this initiative can help us to focus on the needs. But I think the debate is DGRTD will work with the Joint Research Center, will go out public. Uh, we have workshops for test cases. Individual companies can come in. This initiative can come in, CIFIC can come in. And, um, and it's focusing also on chemicals, not all advanced materials. Don't forget the metals and, the and minerals. Yeah, okay, good. Um, is there anything else here? Probably newer. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I think we have covered most now. Are you planning to study subsidies for the production of new advanced materials in the EU? Maybe that I take and then I'm happy to hand over also to the next speaker. Yeah, I mean, um, subsidies is one one area of innovation policy or supporting policy in a uh, proper policy framework. Um, 
so if if that if that is a viable policy option, and I think that is still uh, to be to be discussed in in the working group. Um, what is the what is the most efficient way to um, to improve um, from from design into uh, new market applications? Um, of course, there is. Um, the, the the value of that has to be bridged. Um, how this has to be bridged? I think there are existing uh, policies already in the EU. Yeah. Um, State aid. Yeah. Yeah. But voila, that's. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I would suggest we conclude now on this point. And and uh, many thanks to you, Justin, and to your colleagues who put all this together and got many very ambitious questions. <laughs> Uh, indeed, indeed. So it will help. For maybe this session has also helped a bit to clarify that it's not about making new legislation or looking into state aid, but actually to have a good connectivity between what is happening on the regulatory and the policy side and what does it mean for research innovation. Yeah, good. Many indeed. thanks, Justin. I see thank you very that. Much. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I see that uh, Eva Schillinger is joining us. Hello, good afternoon, Eva. Uh, I'm very glad to see you. Uh, Eva Schillinger is the Senior Innovation Manager with CEFIC. Uh, she's also the Chief Secretary of SASCAM, which is the European Technology Platform for Systemic Chemistry. And she is the Chair of the Working Group Number 4. Uh, you are a person also with rich experience. I think you had also leading positions in the BASF and uh, chemists, material scientists. So <laughs> that's a lot of brain power now, which I see. So over to you, Eva, and we're all looking now with great interest into your presentation. Over to you. Thank you. We can't hear you, Eva. We can't hear you. No, it's still, there seems to be a connectivity issue. At least I can't hear you. We have time. <laughs> no, still it's not working. Okay. Uh, okay, let's take two or three minutes of a break and if I will give you the time and then I decide what to do best. <laughs> I had to stress this morning at 10 o'clock, no worries. <laughs> You're changing the venue, exactly. Do some sport like me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, um, I see you is connecting. So if you're just a bit patient with us, this can happen. You can hear me now. Oh, fantastic. You're loud and clear. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. So over to you, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we cannot hear you, Eva. Uh, we lost you now. Okay, let's wait two or three minutes. I feel. Let's wait two or two or three minutes. Uh, I hope she will be soon back. So I hope you can hear and see me now. Perfect. 
Yes, I see you have, <laughs> now you are not, it's still if I, we can hear you now, perfect. So, I hope you can hear me now, I hope you can see me now. Thank you very much, Justin, for letting me use your computer, always helpful when you have a colleague to help you. Good. Um, so, I will make sure not to lose any more time now. Um, as Jürgen already mentioned, I had the pleasure of, I have the pleasure of chairing the working group four in the Advanced Materials Initiative. Here, uh, we are dealing with the materials innovation markets. Um, what you can see here on the slide is that uh, we have focused on nine material innovation markets so far, ranging from healthcare, transport, textiles to electronics appliances. These um, materials innovation markets are chosen for their strategic importance and it is an initial selection. Um, here, clearly, a spillover approach is intended to be applied, meaning if uh, relevant motives, uh, relevant um, common interests in different sectors are being identified, then of course the aim is to transfer here these motives, needs, methodologies, whatever it may be, to the other materials innovation markets as well. However, of course, these nine materials innovation markets in their um, diversity and in their specificity are not um, alike. So um, what was done so far is that under each of the nine materials innovation markets, three to four priorities were identified. Um, we put them here on the right hand side of the slide, very small. Um, I do not think that it is uh, necessary right now for the sake of this um, this uh, review to go into detail on each and every single one of them. Um, however, we definitely had in a broader stakeholder consultation the opportunity to verify the importance um, of each of the set priorities and to confirm that those are really the relevant ones. Next slide, please. So, um, this slide you have seen a couple of times today already. Um, I would like now to talk a bit about what um, does the dimension of problems and the resulting needs actually mean broken down on working group four for the materials innovation markets. Next, please. When we talk about, yeah, when we talk about uh, new solutions that are needed to reduce costs and risks and to accelerate and shorten the material development uh, cycles, we really um, would see for the working group four here to have um, in parentheses digital, um, in more general terms, tools available and to really be able to identify overarching design, research and innovation, any other aspect that might be of relevance to more than one of these materials innovation markets guidelines. Um, and then to really um, be able to set up the corresponding um, set of, of, of tools and of parameters needed for the respective materials innovation markets. This, of course, um, in terms of aligning stakeholders and integrating stakeholders on, on common goals means that we um, have to take into consideration that an efficient and seamless translation of um, lower TRL uh, research and innovation into then um, higher TRL um, um, steps and processes uh, such as, for example, upscaling manufacturing processes, etc., 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 along the value chains needs to be ensured. Next one, please. The ambitious and coordinated investments, and I think this almost goes without saying, um, have to be in place, of course, for um, supporting um, what we are seeing as necessary in the materials innovation markets under the uh, stakeholders alignment and integration point. And next one, please. The same for sure goes for the EU policy frameworks. So we need here really um, by the framework to guarantee a research and innovation friendly policy framework that supports these accelerated or this aim for accelerating the activities in an appropriate manner. Um, next one, please. So a couple of times already today, um, especially also in the sessions of, of my colleagues, Jose, uh, of my colleague Jose, it was mentioned that raw materials for sure do play um, a critical role. Uh, the same goes for alternative um, uh, raw materials or um, alternative raw material sourcing. 
And we see here that the materials innovation markets, many of them are uh, driven by key uh, raw or advanced material needs. And this is clearly something that we are aware of and that needs to be addressed in our work. Um, and last, but uh, actually not least, on the contrary, this is uh, one of the bigger points that we definitely uh, also had as feedbacks from our um, stakeholder consultations. We really see the crucial need um, for the enabling technology building blocks of, um, of, of yeah, circular um, processes uh, in, in order to move towards green and sustainable materials. And here for sure, we will benefit from um, uh, across fertilization, across uh, the materials innovation markets and value chains. Could you go to the next slide, please? In terms of expected outputs, or rather the results that we would expect, um, breaking it down again to the materials innovation markets. Um, next, please. In combination with the accelerated development um, uh, of safe and sustain sustainable um, advanced materials and the associated process technologies, um, our expected result from working group for work would be that we would be able to um, provide platforms um, that assemble digital tools and again these overarching design research and innovation guidelines and um, basically if you so wish on um, um, knowledge and methodology hub sharing um, for each materials innovation market for a faster delivery. Um, of these safe and sustainable advanced material solutions. When we are considering the rapid design of uh, the innovative materials and their inter integration, um, we need to look at this really on the one hand side, of course, specific to each and every single one of the material innovation markets, but also draw our um, cross cutting um, or uh, cutting across the materials innovation markets um, conclusions out of this and thus then be able to um, enable a faster technology adoption and uptake. Uh, next one, please. Closing the materials loop, um, I already mentioned uh, the desperate and urgent needs together with, uh, especially also in the light of alternative raw material sourcing. Um, when we look at this, we really have seen another uh, underlying principle needs to be in going forward that we are working towards circular value chains for the MIMS, of course, also across the MIMS. So this does not necessarily also mean for us that a, um, a value chain needs to be circularly closed only and specifically within one materials innovation markets, but also here we could see a potential interaction across the different materials innovation markets. Um, the maximization of the overall impact, what we concretely expect from work done and working group four would be really to be able to contribute or to, uh, to a strategic and competitive um, advanced material solution acceleration to the market. Next slide, please. So, uh, it is clear that from the overall proposed action within the Advanced Materials 2030 initiative, um, Working Group 4 plays a role in all of the proposed actions. Um, it has to be because uh, for sure we are talking advanced materials and these advanced materials go into the materials innovation markets. Nevertheless, um, there is four proposed actions that have been identified as having a particular significance um, for the mat um, materials innovation markets. And that is uh, first and foremost, the very, very broad and basically all encompassing action of uh, setting up the tools that are needed for the design, for the manufacturing, for um, the enabling of circularity and also for the testing principles in order to obtain um, quickly uh, scalable advanced materials uh, development timelines. Um, another one that has been um, spoken up uh, about a lot today already um, is the reduction and substitution of critical raw materials. And this uh, goes hand in hand, of course, with um, the creation and promotion of uh, possibilities for sustainable material sourcing. Um, the last one that has been 
seen as particularly uh, important to the um, work of Working Group 4 is to demonstrate the key enabling role of advanced materials in achieving the twin green and digital transition, for sure also strategic open autonomy and overall the EU resilience. So now, of course, uh, you are right to ask, how do we want to achieve um, this? Um, so next slide, please. The proposed actions have been uh, broken down into first ideas of um, what could be useful sub actions, sub, sub steps. Um, I'm starting with the first one, which is basically the all encompassing action, uh, which is probably arguably one of the core uh, actions of, of the overall AMI 2030 initiative. And I think Gerhard Goldberg already um, touched on this quite a bit in the morning. Um, I just put it now here in a very simple bullet point, create common data space for fair data, but of course this goes beyond. Um, we definitely um, hear very strongly connect with the work of working group uh, one and with the results that are being achieved in working group one. Um, furthermore, in working group four, of course, what we need to do is uh, we will be identifying common enabling parameters, design principles, motives, if you so wish, uh, technologies, manufacturing technology, technologies um, and testing needs or testing methodologies even to be leveraged uh, between the materials innovation markets. Based on these um, common motives identified, um, the development and implementation of um, basic tools and methodology me methodologies uh, needs to be um, supported and driven, uh, facilitated, and uh, we also will need to generate recommendations towards regulations and standardization. And in this context, of course, work very, very closely together with our colleagues from the reg uh, working group three, which deals with um, the policy aspects of the overall initiative. If you could go to the next slide, please. The reduction and substitution of critical raw materials clearly um, with respect to the materials innovation markets, um, we will need to identify critical raw material or raw material classes across uh, the nine materials innovation markets that have a strategic focus, a very strong strategic focus, and um, device strategies um, for either, of course, the reduction of these raw material needs by bead efficiency increases, manufacturing technologies, uh, elongation of uh, lifetimes, reduction um, of, of, of maintenance needs, etc., etc. On the other hand side, of course, the second uh, leg to this will be to develop innovation strategies for the substitution timelines of critical raw materials. Here, and I think this uh, is, goes without saying, but we anyway put it as an extra point. Uh, we will also be exploring the potential scope of international uh, cooperation on critical raw materials reduction and substitution um, going beyond um, the EU. But for sure, here we will be also looking at uh, and mapping what is available in terms of um, national in initiatives and projects already and uh, thus really um, make full use of, uh, of the network that is available already. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, we will also be looking for sure at sustainable raw material sourcing or material sourcing. Again, this will start with uh, the analysis across the nine materials innovation market value chains as to the common needs. Um, and here, I think it is also important to say that we also need to take into consideration um, the quality level of the uh, raw materials that are actually needed. Um, the identification of the existing initiatives, existing possibilities, but also of the gaps that are still there in the landscapes is another important uh, sub-action that we are envisioning. And um, then again, we will be looking at uh, coming up with a strategy to implement, actually implement sustainable uh, 
material sourcing for existing options, but also, of course, uh, working further on um, such options for the identified gaps. The timelines need to be set for the implementation of such a sourcing with the existing options and with the gaps. And also here, we, of course, will be going beyond what is done uh, in the EU, and we will look at uh, scope of international cooperation on sustainable material sourcing. sourcing. Um, I took the liberty to make the remark here because, of course, um, any action that we will take on uh, creating and promoting sustainable material, raw material sourcing is st very strongly connected to the need um, for um, enabling technologies for the achievement of uh, circularity, so circular value chains. And this is uh, something that I already commented on before as um, a point that we see as crucial in working group for. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, of course, we would also, in the working group four, dealing with, uh, for now, nine materials innovation markets, but dealing really with the markets where we see a great strategic influence of advanced materials, we would like to actually also uh, demonstrate actually those uh, enabling um, abilities of the advanced materials. Um, to achieve the twin green, twin green and digital transition, the open autonomy and the EU resilience. Um, here, our plan would be to uh, start with an analysis for the uh, common needs, gaps and enablers for the nine materials innovation markets. For example, we have already seen that there is quite a number of material innovation markets where the uh, motive of energy storage, the need for appropriate ener energy storage and ener energy storage technologies shows up. Um, the need for circularity already has been clearly uh, discussed by, by me in the session. and. Um, Based on this analysis, we are aiming at identifying case studies that actually would enable us to address the gaps and the needs um, and at the same time are serving strategic innovation markets. Ideally, these case studies, of course, then in the spillover approach would deliver blueprints for other materials innovation markets. Um, we will evaluate those case studies uh, with respect to sustainability, digitalization, the EU resilience, meaning, for example, the raw material usage and um, the strategic open autonomy. For example, when we look at the translation of the very high European research and innovation expertise into real um, superior advanced materials products. And I believe that with this last bullet point, uh, I have actually come to the end of giving you an overview of what we uh, are working on in the working group for so far, and uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Eva. Uh, yeah, we are happy to take three or four questions. I'm a bit conscious of timing, but this is also technicalities of this working, because it's quite Apologies. an impressive, impressive roadmap, what you're putting, and you're touching also on raw materials and critical raw materials. Um, here are the questions, and uh, how to position AMI 2030 in relation to these initiatives on developing materials for hydrogen batteries buildings. Then we have a question about nine different innovation markets I mentioned in the materials manifesto and in the AMI roadmap. Is it a closed list or do other markets be covered? Uh, okay, we have already nine, which is a lot. <laughs> but maybe you can shed some light on this. And then we have one on intelligent and functional services to give added value to materials. If we can take these three questions, that would be good. Yes, of course. So, of course, um, as we have been saying before, and I think there was also a question in, in a session earlier this morning, um, the AMI 2030 is aiming to be um, yeah, a cross-sectional enabling platform, if you so wish. So, of course, when we look at um, successful material development cases from fields such as hydrogen batteries, buildings, um, the aim is here really to transfer um, the success factors, if you so wish, um, from one sector to another sector of activities and uh, to really identify common challenges. And this is why we actually do not see, um, we do not see this as, as an 
anything else but complementary, right? Because this is uh, AMI 2030 is about really making the cross-linking connection between the different fields. Um, now, the next question was how to prioritize between the different innovation markets. Um, or no, nine different innovation markets are mentioned. I think those were the three questions, right? Okay, so the nine different innovation markets are by no means exhaustive. Those are the ones that uh, were identified as a starting point with a particular strategic relevance. Nevertheless, of course, if there's further materials innovation markets that fit the objective and um, of, of the advanced materials initiative and um, also fit with the high level impacts to be um, expected, then um, there is nothing to be said against opening up or changing, altering the selection of materials innovation markets. Um, and the last one was the one about uh, coating surfaces uh, or coated surfaces, um, which is actually quite close to my heart anyway, because I come from a coatings background. So functional coatings is always a very promising topic. And yes, for sure, we have in one of the um, priorities under the materials innovation markets been uh, collecting quite a bit of input and discussing quite a bit of functionalized surfaces, especially by coatings. This is something that completely falls within the scope of the advanced materials initiative as well. Innovation okay. markets, okay, that's a tricky one. And can you elaborate a bit more on the spillover approach between MIMS and that was mentioned in the first session? Yes. Okay, and, and spillover approach is, um, in other words, what you could say is really, it is, um, yeah, it is a bit of a best practice sharing approach, clearly. So um, the idea behind is, okay, what, what, works in one materials innovation market, of course, not in terms of complete details, because uh, as we also have been discussing quite frequently, in the end, every material that you bring to market will differ from the next one, that is clear. Nevertheless, there are basic underlying um, either success factors or methodologies or principles um, that if identified could serve very, very, very powerfully also in other materials innovation markets or sectors. And this is actually what is meant by the spillover approach. So taking something that really um, due to clearly identifiable factors worked well in one or several of the materials innovation markets, um, analyze as to what were the factors for this working so well, and then uh, transferring it accordingly with the knowledge about the, uh, the, the, the other material innovation markets to further material innovation markets. Thank you. Okay, I take the last one since there are three people who want to have an eye. What about materials for nuclear, fission fusion for nuclear waste, hula? Is it out of your scope? That's a big one. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a big one. And um, frankly, I would not see as long as these are advanced materials that come with uh, specific superior performances, why they should per se be out of the scope of the initiative. This when it is comes completely to the spillover, clear. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. this is completely clear to me. Um, nevertheless, of course, what we have to bear in mind is that advanced materials are really defined as superiorly and very specifically with a focus tailored mm -hmm. uh, materials. So um, we are not so much talking about incremental improvements here, but it really needs to be then an advancement of the material per se. I think here the definition of the advanced material then is more important than the actual material. Okay, thank you for shedding some light on this. Okay, I'm conscious of timing. Uh, so uh, if, uh, if you bear with me, thank you for having made the presentations. Thank you for having changed quickly during a conference also the screens. We are getting oh, used to this. <laughs> so thank you to Justin for helping out. Much appreciated. I think uh, what I take from you, this is a very rich agenda going on and there's still an opportunity to engage. I will explain this also in my concluding remarks. Yeah? Yes, okay. definitely. Good. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank and you. I, thank you to you. And I would like now to change this perspective. So we are moving away from presentations, question answers,
uh, to something completely different. Uh, okay. Fresh debate, what all this is about advanced materials. So uh, I would like now uh, not to enter the stage, but to open up their cameras. This is Rosita Cotone, I Fabrice Dessin, whom you already see. I have also uh, Roland Brandenburg and Jaroslav Pikarski. So you're, you're all with us. Am I relieved that this is working? Okay, good. And uh, I hope Fabrice, you're also with us, yeah? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Wow, fantastic. Okay. So this is, if I may start before I present you individually, a truly interdisciplinary panel. I was very positive through the prize because you have here biology, you have chemistry, you have material science, you have applied mechanics and physics all around the table. All, even with a PhD, so lots of intelligence. But this was not the main reason why I was calling for this panel, because I think uh, you, Rosita Catono, you were working in the Ministry for Education Research in Germany. Uh, so you're a member of the expert group on advanced materials. We have, I think, you, Roland Brandenburg, who is uh, from Austria and who's a key leader on the Maranets. So the Maranets on materials and Peter Drell already mentioned them this morning. Uh, and you have a strong coordinating role with the FFG in Austria. We have uh, Jaroslav Pikarski, who is the coordinator on technology, industrial technologies uh, uh, and the NCP contact point in Poland. And we have Fabrice Tassin, of course, who is the industry co-chair of the ME initiative. Um, we all agreed not to have PowerPoint presentations. There are a few questions. Uh, and the purpose of this panel is really to take a fresh, critical and open look on what we want to do in advanced materials going beyond the ME initiative. And um, I would like to start with yeah, three questions and there's a possibility then also to ask questions via Slido. Uh, my first question is a very basic one on advanced materials. Okay, we're running the usual work programs at national level, at European level. Is there a need for action? And if so, why beyond the usual work programs? That would be a bit my first question to get new perspectives, strategic perspectives. And um, if okay for the gentleman, I'm happy to start with you, Rosita, to give you the floor. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Tite, for your invitation uh, to this panel discussion and your kind introduction. So let me focus then on your first question, if there is a real need for action on advanced materials. And my answer is yes, of course, there is a real need for action in this field. So we have already heard in various sessions of today's workshop that advanced materials will be indispensable and highly relevant for safeguarding technological sovereignty of the European Union, but also for member states as, for example, Germany, as they are a driver for resource efficiency. Technological sovereignty in the field of key enabling technologies depends on materials as they serve as a basis and if you like, they serve as an enabler for many other key enabling technologies as microelectronics, digital technologies as AI, quantum technologies, just to mention a few in this context. Secondly, advanced materials have a crucial role to play for successful green and digital transition of society and industry. But although materials have this important role, in all of, uh, so that's a personal impression. So I have really now to speak for Germany. I would say that the importance is not adequately reflected by an appropriate funding within national and EU RNE budgets. This is an opposite trend in contrast to many other countries, as for example, China, South Korea, and the US, where materials sciences are funded intensively and seen as a priority topic, being rather critical for strategic future investments. So this trend is also reflected in a continuous decrease of international competitiveness in the case of Germany, I would say. 
and this with regard to scientific publication, patents, and many other indicators. So Europe and Germany cannot afford this, and we have to stop and counteract to this trend. And because of this finding, I would like to conclude that, of course, we have to stop and counteract this trend by, yes, to, just to put it in a nutshell, I totally agree that there is a tremendous need for action in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much for this clear <laughs> statement and also for shedding some light. Actually, you have also a debate going on in Germany, quite a big debate. Um, I'm happy to hand over now to Fabrice Tassin, maybe less in the role as the industry co-chair, but Yomiko, so you're the industry. What does the industry think about advanced materials and where Europe should go? If there is a need and for action. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jürgen. I hope that you can still hear me very well. Very well. Um, very I would well. like to say that I agree with everything that Mrs. Cotone has said, because this is really uh, resonating quite well with me. Maybe I can give you a little bit more of an industrial uh, light on that. Uh, it's true that, as uh, Peter said, we have a very strong industrial basis in Europe, but we are not operating in vacuum. And it's true that in the US and in Southeast Asia and in China, uh, the attention to advanced materials is, is very high and, uh, and, um, and you see a lot of moves there. Um, we are operating in very challenging conditions for the moment as an industry. Uh, you could say that there are a couple of pressure elements coming from all angles. Um, on the demand side, I would say that you have a pressure for more and more performant materials in very, very complex applications. If you take, for example, an iPhone, I think it contains more than 18 different metals. So as we move towards more performance, the materials become more and more complex. On top of that, of course, we have pressure from the customers, the other industrial group to reduce the price of these advanced materials. They have to protect their profitability margins. And on top of that, and for very much most of the cases, very good reasons. There's a pressure to be more ethical, more sustainable, and to comply with ever more severe frameworks. So you have all these pressures to take into account. And these pressures, they are pretty much global, I would say. But if you now zoom in into a European uh, angle, you have two elements in Europe which are hurting businesses, is the cost of energy and the cost of labor. And on that, it's very difficult to be very creative and to change it. So when you take this into, these elements into account, the only way that you can alleviate the pressure on cost of energy and cost of labor is to make materials that are even more performant. So actually, you have no choice. You have to develop materials that are even more performant for all these good reasons. And the only way to compete is therefore through innovation. The, the problem that we have with innovation in materials is that it's becoming very costly. It's of course also taking more and more time. And the applications that we are going to serve with these materials, they have a shorter product life cycle. So we really have no choice than to try to accelerate the speed at which we discover, we produce and we market materials for the customers. So this is the only way to compete. And uh, that's more, I would say, product innovation, if you want. But of course, we also have to be able to produce these materials at a cost which is competitive. And that's more the process innovation point of view. Uh, and I will finish with just another element is that it's not only good for the advanced materials industry. It's also very good for our customers, those who make batteries, those who make photovoltaics, those who make wind turbines, because if they operate in Europe, they are also under the pressure of the cost of energy and the cost of labor. And it has been shown that if you use more performant materials, the share of materials in the cost structure increases. Therefore, you are much less exposed to the cost of energy and the cost of labor. So the only way forward is innovation. And this cannot happen in a business as usual uh, scenario, as you can understand. So therefore, we need to act in a much more comprehensive way and more systemic, as Peter said in the morning. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, turning to Roland Brandenburg, who brings also rich background and experience due to the Meranet, uh, which you're running now, uh, 
and which will expire in 2026. How do you see this challenging question? Is there a need to act, but why exactly? Because a need to act, okay, everybody easily agrees, but the why is important. We call it in Brussels also a bit the intervention logic, which sounds very strange, but it's a very important. What problems we exactly want to address and what means? Uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I can only um, add to what has been said already. Um, it has become very clear from the presentations this morning and this afternoon that um, action is needed. Um, it has also been mentioned that there's a clear goal to reinforce the European sovereignty uh, to make sure that the global leadership can be maintained and there's some strategic autonomy because its advanced materials are all over the place and um, are a source of uh, prosperity of our uh, society. In particular, they're crucial for enabling the green and digital um, transition, the twin transition, uh, which means that we need to find solutions, for example, for light weighting, uh, for enhancing the durability of processes. Uh, we need to improve the performance, uh, what Fabrice also mentioned already. Um, and therefore, uh, basically, we need to enable um, the uh, circular economy, uh, designs for recycling, minimize the environmental footprint, um, and also reduce the dependency on critical uh, raw materials. So there have been plenty of comments this morning also from the ARM side. Um, and this basically means we have to uh, come up with very significant efforts and um, we need to address these global challenges um, in a structured way. We need to overcome barriers and obstacles um, that exist um, by establishing a better governance at all levels, including regional, national, European and international uh, levels and stakeholders. And um, there's a need for better alignment of activities and uh, policies at these levels to achieve the uh, desired synergies. Um, and speaking for uh, um, the network of funding organizations that we have established um, in the context of Emirinet uh, over the past 10 years, we are already uh, trying to accommodate uh, these needs by um, bringing in industry stakeholders into our cycles, uh, the member states with their funding organizations and policy makers. Um, we're trying to uh, identify the topics that um, of uh, particular relevance uh, and um, corresponding TRL ranges so that we can achieve these um, integrative approaches across um, uh, disciplines and application uh, fields. So I'm very much convinced that we need to have um, a better uh, collaboration, more intensified cooperation of all stakeholders, and I'm actually looking very much forward to uh, contributing to this. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Jaroslav Pikarski, different perspective or not? <laughs> yes. Uh, as you said, uh, I, uh, I have been a Polish representative to program committees for framework programs uh, just now for over 15 years, since the beginning of uh, seven framework program for Horizon uh, 2020. And now I'm responsible for Horizon Europe. Also, I'm representing Poland in uh, expert groups for advanced, your expert groups for advanced materials. Uh, so really, also, I have coordinated preparation for future materials conference in 2011. So I'm deeply involved in the community and I can say I cannot have different opinion on the need of this initiative as uh, my, as the speakers before me, as Rosita, as uh, uh, Fabrice, as uh, Roland. Of course, it's necessary. And the need of integration of materials development effort has been recognized uh, uh, was recognized for uh, has been recognized for years means even during six or even from six pro framework program some coordination actions 
have been supported by the Commission, like uh, Network of, for, of Excellence uh, for Multi-Component Materials. It was uh, coordinated by my uh, maternal uh, institute. Uh, the time I was researcher. Next, we could uh, we will uh, the project NanoRec coordinating effort uh, member states efforts uh, towards. Uh, uh, regulations on nanomaterials and next uh, several actions uh, that uh, were just now represented by Alliance for Materials. It's a long list, part of this uh, initiative, so maybe all of these initiatives are included in this action. So really it's necessary. What is added value of this action is that it's really recognized by uh, high level policy makers. And it's really very important point for development of the initiative uh, to make it successful. So, first is involvement also policy makers and involvement of industry, not only materials developers or materials, materials suppliers, but also materials users. So, uh, at least uh, in the presentation of uh, uh, of uh, 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 Jose of uh, Carlos Caldera, we seen the interest of uh, manufacturing community. So it's also added value. So this uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, two issues are very important, and it's very important also to coordinate the. Uh, means just now fragmented efforts. Since the beginning of Horizon 2020, practically we observed, uh, have uh, uh, we were witnessed the fragmentation of uh, materials research. Just now in Horizon Europe, we can find materials topics in five out of six clusters. And practically preparation of each part of the Horizon, of Horizon Europe program is. Uh, uh, performed independently. It's uh, we need really coordination at least at the level of Horizon Europe, but we need also coordination of uh, national efforts. So uh, that's why this initiative is very uh, very needed, and uh, it should be uh, a game changer. A game changer. And really, I wish to this initiative uh, to. To became it, not to be additional actor on the scheme, because it's not worth to do it uh, to be one more, uh, one more, uh, one more uh, subject of the game. We need coordination. Thank you. Thank you, Yaroslav. Good. If you think that was the easy question, I have now another question. Uh, you will have heard Peter Joel this morning when one question was coming up. Is any follow up as the regards the Commission for the next framework program? Then we would be in a time horizon of 2027. Or is it actually for this year when we review the so called strategic plan under Horizon Europe, when we review the partnerships? Uh, that was the first point, and Peter Joel was quite clear saying this is actually for this year. It's not for the next framework program, it is within Horizon Europe. He emphasized also another point is this is not only about partnerships, the initiative as regards the Commission can go also beyond the partnership. Other things could be done. Now, and that leads me a bit to the following question. So we have the AMI initiative. We got now an insight into the ongoing work. But other initiatives are also discussed at the EU level. We had the colleagues dealing here on raw materials. They exist in Eramen, the Critical Raw Materials Act. We have national initiatives. We have the Meranet. Uh, what would you, can we bring all this together in a single initiative? And now the question, why I will listen very carefully. <laughs> what would you expect from the commission? <laughs> uh, so. Peter Joel launchable. I will listen now very carefully. I'm maybe not able to answer to all your remarks now, but I think it would be a great moment a bit. Yeah, what would you expect from the European Commission now uh, this year? So, um, I don't know. Should I start with you, uh, uh, Rosita Cotone, again? 
tough question. <laughs> Thank you. And it's a good offer that you ask me what I wish from the Commission, what should be implemented. So I can just speak for the BMBF. So we wish really to reach better coordination between activities. And I think it makes sense to pool resources to be more efficient with the money with, uh, which is inside the whole system. But of course, it's, it's still important to have national programs funding priorities because they could differ between the different member states or regions, but um, I think we should really try to collaborate closely together. We can find out where are the interfaces. So what could we offer, for example, from our, let's say, portfolio at the BNBF, what could be used also on European scale? And it is clear that many um, people from Germany, scientists, but also industrial stakeholders, which participated in, in our national process, they are also members of this AMI initiative. And this makes sense because we are part of the European Union. And therefore, I think it's a good way to interact with these people to hear what is going on on European scale, what could be also, let's say, offered. So we have, for example, the Materials Digital Initiative, which I think is highly relevant to these activities which are ongoing in this field in AMI 2030. And we're willing really to collaborate if it makes sense, if there is really, let's say, also the same focus, because for the BMBF, we are rather focused on applied research and Amy is, is a very broad initiative. What we also can, can offer is, for example, you, it was mentioned several times before the SSBD concept. We already had several workshops with industrial stakeholders, but also with representatives from research organizations to hear. So what is their experience? And also what are the concerns of these stakeholders with regard to this concept? And I think um, we could also try to uh, share our views and experiences now we, we gained from, from our stakeholders with you. Uh, just to really to improve or also change um, this concept for the future to make it really applicable and suitable or for, for all the users which have to deal with it. So these are just a few examples. Okay, thank you very much. Very clear. <laughs> we will digest and consider, but I would like to get a bit the views of the other panelists as well. Um, before I move to Fabrice, maybe Roland Brandenburg, what, are, what would be your expectations towards the Commission? Uh, and and uh, I would be really interested because you're running a very important era net, the Mera net, and yeah, would be good a bit. What what would you like to to put on on my plate here on the commission side? Um, we've seen in I think the introductory presentation a slide which showed um, several initiatives under Horizon Europe and uh, the Army initiative sitting more or less close to the center of uh, this. A network uh, diagram. Um, it's even more complex because in addition to the Horizon Europe uh, partnerships and uh, CSAs and stuff, there's also ongoing Horizon 2020 initiatives. Um, there's more than Horizon Europe, for example, Digital Europe. There's uh, initiatives such as uh, Eureka and uh, national regional initiatives that are also relevant. And all these um, initiatives need to be considered in a suitable way. And I guess um, the Commission could support this process by uh, helping identify uh, relevant initiatives or the um, um, appropriate scope of uh, any such initiative uh, to facilitate an efficient and effective um, cooperation. Um, there will be um, overlaps uh, which need to be reduced or redundancies that need to be eliminated to make sure that we focus um, our resources um, in the most um, efficient way possible. Um, if possible, um, we need support and the re reduction of complexity and um, basically a better coordination of um, available funding between all levels of um, funding sources, including commission funding, member states um, funding, national and regional funding. Um, and in order to be able to do this, um, there need to be milestones um, to be defined 
Um, this will also include the identification of uh, suitable instruments, which has been mentioned um, earlier, and um, this will help us to achieve um, common goals, the better alignment of activities and uh, policies um, at all levels, and uh, to make sure that we mobilize uh, a sufficient uh, level of funding. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. You were very kind not to say that the Marinets is ex expiring 2026, but I'm going to say it, and we'll listen to this also very carefully, of course. <laughs> this is something important we have to look at, and uh, therefore also this question. Uh, Jaroslav Pikarski, and then I'm happy to look also at Fabrice Tassin. Jaroslav. You are muted. We can't hear you. Sorry. Now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, as I said uh, uh, in previous intervention, there is a, a strong fragmentation of uh, materials research even under Horizon Europe, and it's uh, it's hard to co to uh, to coordinate them. At, even at the Commission level, all of these initiatives are uh, run under the same uh, legal framework. We have also around ten. Uh, uh, around 10 partnerships with materials in the agenda. So really it's a challenge and I think it's not possible to coordinate effort, especially that each country has own uh, own uh, legal system, own, own framework for run uh, initiatives. But that's why I agree with Rosita that collaboration is needed, but uh, collaboration and hard to say coordination. Uh, as concerned Poland, most of uh, funds uh, used as uh, grants are based on structural funds. It means uh, national funds for research and development are used generally to make institutions operational. And I can estimate that around 80% of uh, grants are funded from structural funds. And they are spent in line with national smart specialization and one of the uh, of uh, uh, 13 uh, one out of 13 polish national smart specialization are advanced materials so this uh, area is really recognized by uh, by polish government bond uh, by polish policy makers anyway we are we have any say functional or a structure any program that uh, supports material and uh, there is uh, no plan to run program for materials the only indication is that uh, uh, proposals submitted to uh, structural funds research uh, should be in line with national smart specialization that's why it's very hard offer the structure for collaboration from Polish side. So okay. that's why uh, from at this uh, point of view, I can say that uh, uh, we need for short term, we need collaboration. For a long term, I think we need to think about common framework for, uh, for research at European level and at national level. Maybe it would facilitate the, uh, the, the integration of uh, research effort. So, uh, but it's not for this initiative, it's a long-term issue. What I mean just now, for instance, uh, we could uh, follow the same rules of organization of uh, calls, say, Harmonize the national rules uh, for calls with uh, with uh, Horizon, something like, because just now a uh, system of submission is completely different, uh, completely different system of evaluation and so on. So maybe this would allow to harmonize EU central effort with national wise. Of course, it's necessary to have the will of uh, policymakers for that. Thanks. Okay. Is, if you know, before I pass the floor to Fabrice, as regards the political will to have more synergies between, for instance, 
structural funding and Horizon Europe funding. Since July, there exist from an institutional point of view so-called guidelines, which the Commission has put forward, very much requested by the member states. But I will not delve on on this now, but it's just there is a, a political will overall there. Uh, good. But over to you, Fabrice. Uh, what would you expect from the industry side? Keep it simple, lots of money. <laughs> what would you expect? Because it's also about technology sovereignty and, and what, what were your expectations, how to bring all these initiatives in a good way together? Well, I would not be too simple, uh, but uh, I'm trying to uh, also build on what has been said before. I think that fragmentation is one of the keywords, honestly, uh, for industry. When we look at the European landscape, it is fragmented. Uh, it is at what it is. There's a fragmentation of projects. There's a fragmentation of priorities, of programs. The knowledge is, of course, then disseminated in a uh, all over the place and maybe sometimes those who need it the most and i want to say for example the small and medium-sized companies they have much more difficult access to it than big groups who can try to find uh, the information and the knowledge where it is so a tackle of fragmentation is i think a, something that we need in what ami will bring um, i don't want to say that we have to go towards a fully centralized system this is not what i say we need to find a balance between centralized and decentralized and in that respect I think you need a very strong European level on materials, but you also need very good member state level because they are the foundations. So you need both. Um, where we can do more, I think, is in, is in identifying the synergies that would be the low hanging fruits and trying at least to connect as much as possible on where we see the synergies. Um, what I would like to avoid is that we end up in a system that is, however, too uh, rigid. So we have to find a way to keep the system dynamic. Uh, that would be a couple of design principles that I think that the industry would like to see. Uh, Europe is a complicated continent because this is 27 member states. And of course, I don't know how many hundreds of regions. Some regions of the world are much easier to navigate. But it is what it is, and we have to take that into account. We have to tackle into account, to take into account the fragmentation. It is there, but I think we have to turn it into an advantage. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm tempted to reverse now the order, because my next question is actually about the industry interests, because we hear a lot about batteries. We have a partnership, hydrogen. We have a new initiative. A lot going on on materials. Now we heard today about the spillover approach to be more horizontal, to learn from each other. For such a concept, do we need to attract more industry interest into such a new initiative? And if so, how? Fabrice, what would you what would you say? <laughs> Starting I, can, now, I, can, I can make it short. I can say yes. <laughs> yeah, no. but how? 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 No, yeah, how? I think what would you tell how? companies listening now why this is relevant for for industries as well? Yeah, it's, it's the chance to shape a system to make sure it fits your interest and that you can keep on doing innovation in Europe, working with the best researchers, profiting from the best facilities. And honestly, you know, if companies can do innovation within a, re a radius of 200 and 300 or 400 kilometer, it's always better than to do research uh, with uh, people who may, who may be thousands of kilometers away from you in a different time zone. So we always prefer local whenever we can. Uh, of course, maybe industry now, some industrial companies are not yet part of the initiative because uh, you know that uh, the industry for the moment is very much short term focused because of the crisis mode. So, uh, but my call to them would be to say, okay, look a little bit beyond, do not look too much short term. A little bit like what Yaroslav was saying, we have to look also a little bit more than short term and step in, check where you can contribute to the working groups. If you don't have time, do not work on all the working groups, focus on one or two or three, and then make yourself your own opinion. You can only know if you like it by trying it. But, uh, also, when the initiative is much more concrete in terms of having selected the instrument and having clear idea of where we want to go and how, uh, I predicted that you will see a massive influx of companies and maybe you will see more small and medium-sized companies and startups also step, uh, stepping in 
because for them, it, the pressure on short term is even higher than for big companies. So uh, they will come, but they will come maybe at the time that is a bit later uh, when things are a bit more concrete for some of them. Okay, thank you. Um, on Meranet, I think I heard that it's also an industry interest. Uh, Roland, what would you answer to this question about do we need to attract more industry interest in, in an initiative? And if so, how can we do this best? Any lessons you learned or any recommendations you would like to give? Mm -hmm. Well, since uh, the Aeronet uh, operates with uh, existing uh, national and regional funding schemes, we uh, depend on the regulations and the criteria of these um, contributing initiatives, uh, which means that um, there's a theoretical range that is covered uh, which may be, may be different from country to country or from region to region. Um, altogether, we've seen that uh, the participating um, almost 50 funding uh, organizations um, cover a theoretical range from uh, one to eight or even nine with a maximum between two and five, basically. So uh, the industry involvement depends on the TRL uh, range, which is offered in the course for proposals. And this may depend on the uh, the topics. Um, different topics have different uh, theory ranges. And for this, we've been um, relying on input from uh, uh, industry experts over the past um, years. And therefore, I guess it will also be necessary to look at the um, presented innovation markets that we saw today. Uh, there may be a difference um, between these areas when it comes to potential um, industry um, involvement. In the joint course that the MRN has launched, um, on average, we've seen an industry participation um, in the funding projects of around 35%. And in particular, since it has also been mentioned, the SMEs play an important role um, in this course uh, with uh, around 25% of all funded applicants, and they have a success rate of uh, more than 20%. Um, one thing that they need in order to participate successfully is uh, funding instruments that are attractive uh, to them, which means they require low complexity, uh, low efforts if possible, uh, short time to contract, and uh, also support concerning IPR issues will be something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I Turn to Rosita Cotone about your national experiences. Jaroslav, what, how do you see the, uh, the role of industries into a new initiative and, and what can we do and how? Yes, uh, the uh, engagement of industry is crucial for this initiative in order to achieve uh, the expected impact, means the benefits for the society, the benefits for the planet, and so on. Only through products. The materials can uh, express their importance, the value. So uh, that's why it's necessary to have industry. And uh, I think this idea for uh, innovation markets is important as it uh, creates uh, the field for uh, market pool it's, uh, for this driver. So really, it's nice, but also the uh, as it was. Again, <laughs> turn to the words of uh, uh, Carlos that it's necessary to have the uh, situation win win. The industry, especially the uh, users of materials, should uh, uh, see the um, value of collaborating under the initiative, means they have to have the space for uh, for 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 the activities uh, to to have some uh, some benefits i think this space would be what was underlined also in eva presentation this uh, materials acceleration platforms or open innovation test beds the space where the material developments can uh, be transferred into products and uh, so it's really important to create this uh, core of the initiative means this materials commons 
and also with uh, a suitable space for uh, development of materials into products, uh, so acceleration platforms, testbeds, and so on, how we call it, doesn't matter. And uh, for that, really, uh, space for a discussion, space for uh, collaboration with industry is necessary. Also, it's necessary to change a little bit mind of uh, uh, of the industry in order to convince them to the open innovation idea, because this idea is present in the research area for 10 years, but sometimes talking with representatives of industry, it's hard to, to, to convince them to the value of this approach. Okay, thank you very much. Rosita Cotona, what are your experiences in Germany? Because you have also there a debate on where to move on advanced materials, and you clearly set out why you think there is a need to act at national level. Where is the industry? What would actually allow us to bring also the industry more into this? So yes, I already mentioned we all also launched kind of national stakeholder process really to find out how we should adjust our funding. I mean, normally we offer kind of national materials research program that lasts for about 10 years. And the problem is that during this timeline, 10 years, many new trends come up, new technologies, and it's difficult really to bring them in and really to address them appropriately. So we really um, just started earlier with this adjustment and we invited people from industry, industrial associations, but also from our, let's say, research organization as the Helmholtz, the Leibniz, the Fraunhofer Society, Max Planck. So we have a very broad spectrum of relevant actors to discuss with us, to give their input. So what are the needs, maybe the requirements, the societal requirements as well, to maybe to, to change things we have done so far. And this means also to think or rethink the priorities we have set already and also to change funding instruments. So maybe this is um, very similar to this approach. You open up the possibilities now to, to say we need maybe a partnership, but this partnership could something new during, let's say, the framework of Horizon 2020. I think this is quite important really to see if we could try to adapt and take the strengths out of the system and the consisting initiatives and really maybe improve, let's say, the efficiency of the whole system. It's not always a matter of, let's say, funding. It is, of course, uh, let's say, a precondition to have the funding. But on the other hand, I would say it's sometimes better coordination also for member states is the same that we have, for example, project funding, we have institutional funding, and really you have to find out how you could bridge these things, which are sometimes in peril, really to, to get out the best of it. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so what I take from this, um, no one argues we should no longer deal with low TL under whatever new initiative, because that's where the disruptive element is coming. But what would be my impression is, maybe there needs to be a better communication where disruptive technologies are really needed in which area so that also researchers really see here i should invest and not please forgive me this this term try and error uh, is very much here you should really go into the low trials here's really something here. this is a long-term priority and here's also about de-risking investments by the industry which are not ready to do because they have a different thinking and I hear a lot also about design. We have heard quite a lot about design today, life cycle assessment, which means also for companies, if they need short term, need to fill up the short term priorities, how to embed design into their innovation cycle will be a big, big challenge. And uh, so the design, not the designers, but I think the researchers as designers can help quite a lot. But it will be certainly a big question, uh, which will continue. But now we have time also for Slido questions. So I hope there are a few questions. Martina, you need to help me so that you can show it what is out. And then I'll let everybody react.
Oh, that's a good one. Okay, it's a very political one. NABP calls disappeared in fellow tour for us in Europe. Why is that? Army 30 could be an instrument into shaping a new NABP. Ah, Yaroslav, you actually, maybe you can explain why this, we have cluster four today, but um, no. how to make sure that the ask coordination will provide enough funding for ambitious game changers. Uh, and then what do we need from industry? Do share the most relevant, well posed questions and open issues can happen only on uh, not too short topics. Do you agree? Okay. I'm giving you the three questions. Maybe the first one I was already, I think this is the structure of Horizon Europe where you have no longer any BP, but it's all has gone into the so called cluster digital and in the industry and space. And Horizon Europe is a framework which has been agreed and will be running. So we will not be able this year to return to NMBP. But if you have any other comments on this, uh, any comments on these questions? So the first f first one is a more institutional one, but should we shape something really new in terms of materials? And the coordination, will it provide for enough funding for the ambitious game changers? How realistic should we be? Uh, and then we have the coordination at CEC internally, a uh, very imp important step forward. Okay, I'm happy to answer this one. But any comments on these first two questions in particular on, yeah, we need coordination, but will it really allow us to go for game changers compared to funding? If I may, uh, you, you can yeah. have all the coordination that you want. Of course, you need the resources behind. So. There's a limit to what coordination can achieve, but coordination is the best thing to start because then you are much more efficient with the amount of funding than you have. Afterwards, of course, if you can get much more funding and resources, be it public or private, this is better. But it starts with coordination to make sure that we are efficient in using what we already have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to be more efficient, more effective, actually. Okay. So, may I? Yeah. Yeah. In my understanding, uh, the coordination is for creating common value. The common value for uh, for me, the most important common value of this initiative is the intention to create this uh, uh, materials commons. So common data spaces, common tools, common methods. Uh, say also platforms for materials development. And if we are successful with that then the coordination of, uh, say, materials development effort can be successful. Thanks a lot. Anybody else who wants to come in on this question? Roland or Rosita Cotone? Maybe just to pick up again this aspect of funding. So what mm -hmm. is the problem with materials research? It's, it's not very concrete. I mean, if you take, for example, artificial intelligence or quantum technologies, it's rather, let's say, easy to focus on, on, on this topic. It's new, it's um, um, now materials research. You find not only the materials research program in Germany, you have maybe five to 10 different programs where materials research is funded. And this is really difficult. Another important point, and I'm not pretty sure if this is also uh, in the focus of Amy, people are not aware because we need materials research. So that means we really have to raise awareness because um, it is not only, let's say, the citizens who have to decide what topics are important or should be funded, but the parliamentarians as well. And sometimes my impression is they are not aware of the potential and also the, the central role materials will play in facing the future challenges. So that would also be I think an idea really to to try to make clear that materials or advanced materials are at the center of our, let's say, approaching the future problems. It's not clear to everybody and the people who decide on, on the budget, finally, it's the parliament, are the parliamentarians and we really have to work also on this political scale. So that's my impression. Thank you for this. There's lots of public debate about Critical Raw Materials Act, but you do not target this act. You're actually looking really into advanced materials and its visibility. Okay, very clear. Uh, Roland, any any point on, on, on this? Yeah, maybe I could add that um, we have been coordinating various um, funding sources um, during the past 10 years. It has been very challenging. This is a simple message that I can 
tell you, um, you know, that the Emerald is uh, the largest area consortium that has been funded under Horizon 2020 with almost 50 funding organizations. And um, it only works if everybody sees a clear benefit and added value. So you need to have a common goal and uh, benefit for everybody. And then you may be able to uh, leverage more and more funding um, from national and regional sources. And of course, uh, commission funding also plays an important role. So we see that um, co-funded calls play um, uh, or provide an incentive for national uh, policymakers to contribute uh, relevant uh, substantial budgets, and uh, that helps, of course. Okay, it's the next question, which is very popular, I don't know whether it's addressed to you, to me, but happy also to get comments from you. Coordination at EC internally, a classical one for any EU debate, would be a very important step forward towards more efficiency of funding. What are your plans? Well, I will spare you now, not give you a long speech about co-creation within the Commission in each cluster, which is huge. But those who want to make comments on this also in writing, because I will announce it in my closing remarks, happy to take examples, concrete examples on advanced materials where we can do better. I don't know whether uh, the speakers here would like to take it up and to give us any comment and be frank. I, I have no problem with this. Ah, okay, I see, <laughs> it's a tough statement. <laughs> Your silence seems to be actually, you have some sympathy also for me, but well, I'm very maybe, happy. Yeah, please, yes. Yeah, yes. Maybe, um, a very generic comment uh, concerning instruments because um, the partnerships have been mentioned this morning and this is uh, certainly something which is spread across uh, all types of DGs. And um, from what we see, there's um, a need for strong coordination inside the Commission to make sure that um, these networks um, are able to exploit their potential. Because um, it has been a difficult start, um, that's for sure, but uh, there could be something uh, done inside the Commission uh, to make sure that um, the European partnerships um, run a little bit better than they do now. Okay. Good, fair point. I, I have no problem with this because I will look into this and uh, we have quite a number of partnerships and the synergies. Happy to look into this also for, for the coming year. Good. Um, I look into the next one. How are the plans to involve industry? What contribution shall come from them? Data, resources, materials? That might be mainly a question to you, Fabrice. Uh, are you with us? Yes, I am. Well, yeah. the industry can already be involved right now from the start. This is a little bit what I was saying in previous questions. So if they want to contribute to shaping what we are already doing now, mm -hmm. it's possible through the working groups, as we have said, and there have been presentations all across this morning and this early afternoon about what we do. Now, afterwards, when the uh, instrument is selected and the initiative is running, then you would expect the typical level of collaboration of industry that you have already had in the past in typical collaborative work. So it can be data, it can be resources, it can be materials. Whatever is needed in order to innovate efficiently and effectively has to come from industry. Um, I cannot give a more detailed answer than that. My only call is that for those of you who may still be on the call and questioning whether they should step in or not, Please test the water, step into a working group. It's possible and it's free of charge. It's very inclusive and check for yourself, I would say. Um, and Good. my call goes also to the SMEs because I know that for them, it's a very short term life and death situations for the moment. But please, if you have uh, time, step in as well. Okay. Good. Thanks a lot. I see now one statement, I'll take this as the last question because I, you are free to say yes or no. Or honestly, <laughs> this is too early, this question. Would you agree with the statement that, that was given in the first session that a new partnership appears the most suitable instrument? Any reaction to this? Uh, you may say yes, no, or too early <laughs> because I think we have also representatives of member states here and it's a bit up to them a bit to consider. Uh, any reaction to this question? Uh, if I may, I mean, Fabrice, given, yes. given the scale of all the challenges that we have presented today and the need to coordinate yeah. and tackle fragmentation, 
I'm not a specialist of European instruments, but uh, I think that the partnership is one of the high <laughs> runner-ups in terms of potential uh, instrument to choose. I think it's the way to go. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Um, May I add? It was yeah, Yaroslav, also, please. Yes. It was yeah. also told today that the partnership should be one of instruments for this initiative, but not only one, in order to achieve ambitions of this partnership, it's necessary a uh, much, much wider approach. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, Roland Brandenburg, you would like to come in on this question? Yeah, I mean, it's a very simple comment when we talk about partnerships. Of course, we all know there's uh, three different types of partnerships. And uh, today it has even been mentioned that there are um, ambitions for an additional new type of partnership. Um, we have to see um, what makes the most sense and what is even possible under the Horizon Europe legal framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to look into legal aspects, but also a bit on how can we bring the current initiatives actually together? Because at the end, it's not only us looking at each other, it's, as some of you said, South Korea, US, China, looking also at Europe. And that might be actually really the most important uh, driver in this regard. I'm conscious of timing. Um, we are coming to the end of the panel, and I would like to invite each of you for one minute, any concluding remarks, any messages for the participants, for the AMI initiative, also for the commission, uh, we should take home. Uh, this time I'm starting with Jaroslav. Okay. Any, any big message? I can say, uh, as I said, uh, I'm happy. The initiative arises. Uh, it was expected, I think, by the community. Uh, I had feedback from Polish community and uh, very, very wide uh, uh, response. Uh, so uh, that's why that this community will follow the path to be as open as possible to deal with, uh, say, to try to be a kind of uh, co coordinator and finally game changer in the uh, in the area of uh, materials uh, de development and uh, also that uh, kind of tools will be discussed in order to involve effectively national funds as well. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fabrice Tassin? Yeah, but I would go back to the first uh, presentations, the one of Peter this morning. He said that uh, there were not so many things in which Europe was actually still having a strong leadership. And advanced materials is actually one of the topic with chemistry where we still have a strong leadership in Europe, um, be it industrially, but also with very, very intense research fabric and some startups and some SMEs. Uh, this is, however, very fragile if you compare it also to what's happening on other sides of the world. So we have to do everything we can to nurture it and embrace it. What we bring to the community today with AMI is something that is systemic connective and inclusive and that seems to be able to tackle fragmentation so i think that this is i'm very happy that uh, we have gone so far so well all together and so we have something now on the table that that needs to be supported and taken to the next level thanks a lot uh fabrice uh rotsitsa cotona and then i hand over to roland brandenburg so thank you, Jürgen, and uh, thank you very much to everybody who participated in this meeting. It was very helpful today to get better insight into this initiative. And I would say this is the, the basis also for member states representative to decide whether there's possibility for interaction or not. And I would like to encourage in particular the German participants in this initiative really to Keep in touch with us to let us know about, let's say, current um, activities under AME 2030, because finally, um, we are also happy to receive your feedback, your input, if it comes um, into direction decision on what kind of partnership should be implemented. It is, of course, also the member state who has to reflect and decide on that. 
and therefore it's important really to get this let's say this this input from your side so i can just offer this possibility so i'm already in touch with some of them but i would be happy really to receive more feedback so what is really the need or let's say the the requirement thank you thank you uh roland brandenburg you have nearly the last say. <laughs> yes, and maybe I simply summarize uh, what everybody else has already said because I agree basically to everything. Uh, first of all, we all agree that uh, advanced materials is an area which um, should be further strengthened and supported as much as possible. Um, and this requires uh, a joint effort by bringing together all stakeholders, uh, including industry, researchers, uh, Member states, policymakers, and funding organizations, also including the regions. Um, we have to involve the Commission in order to have a full overview of ongoing initiatives, um, also initiatives outside um, the, the framework program to avoid redundancies and exploit or achieve uh, synergies. And um, um, for future activities, um, as we said, we need to identify. Uh, suitable instruments um, from the available options. And um, if I may conclude with uh, uh, an email, Aaron, that um, item, this has been um, a network of uh, member states for um, a very long time. It's uh, very successful member states initiatives. And I can only hope that um, this initiative um, will sort of continue and uh, be, um, continue to be a powerful basis for future uh, activities in advanced materials. Mm -hmm. Good. Many thanks. So, first of all, thanks a lot for all the panelists. Uh, you had not the liberty of presenting slides. You were exposed to questions. So it was a great pleasure to have you here as a panel. Uh, and it was good that we are coming in also with very different views, that, that we're not only, if you allow this term, not only listen to the ME initiative and give feedback, but also where should the overall debate go. So many thanks to the panel here. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here with us online. And I come now to my concluding remarks, uh, if you allow me. So many thanks uh, to all of you. The first point I would like to make is this has been a very rich session, but it's all ongoing work within the advanced materials initiative and i see already comments uh that what about the questions raised in the online tool and will be some kinds of minutes be shared with all participants i will discuss this uh, with the me representatives what could be done in this regard i would like just to underline the session has been recorded and the session which has been recorded will also be made available both on the Commission website and I think also on the AMI website so that people can follow it, what has been explained. You see this here in the second big bullet point. Uh, why it's important here to have an inclusive and transparent process. I learned quite a lot actually today uh, and I would like to make clear that for the Commission, the work is also now starting. We have the Amin initiative, we have a big stakeholder movement, and you heard the last panel quite clear, there is a need to act. And there's also a need to, to work together. Very important. What will we do? We will to continue accompany the AMI initiative. They announced a draft strategic agenda materials agenda for February, March. That will be for us a very important starting point. It is quite clear that we have also to engage more with member states at the individual level. So I understand the call from Rosita Cotone. Well, please inform me what is going. Yeah, but the Commission has also to reach out now to the member states uh, in the expert group on advanced materials who is present today, uh, but maybe also to the program committee under cluster four where we want to go there's a debate on partnerships, but there are other issues as well, in particular on coordination. Um, so I would like to invite who participated, if they have still comments, questions to the pre presentations today, you can send them to the 
AMI initiative, you see here an email address from AMI 2030, where it can go. We would be very grateful for two things. If you can copy us in, because we have been the chair of this workshop, so we would like to know it would also be for us a learning exercise. I think there is a preference on the side of the AMI initiative to do it by the 25th of January, very, very simple reason, because they would like to come now to a conclusive stage to be to have a very solid uh, draft strategic materials agenda end of February, early March. So it would be good if those who have comments, questions, send them by the 25th of January. Can we turn to the next slide? I would say everybody today mentions the whole international dimension. And I don't want to launch now an international agenda, but I was quite encouraged that there is a strong will on all sides really to work together. And this is what the Commission is offering, not only today, but also in future, with the industry, with the researchers, with the ongoing initiatives to bring them align. And, um, a practical hint, those who are making comments within the two weeks might, for instance, look into the Matthias Genome Initiative in the US and see what they're doing. Since 2021, there's a relaunch of the initiative, Unify the Matthias Innovation Infrastructure, a framework of integrated advanced modeling, computational and experimental tools, and quantitative data. Harness the power of Matthias data. Educate, train, like materials research and development workforce. You heard about it today. Maybe you would like to look at this initiative, have questions and bring them back to the AMI initiative and also to us. It's just one example, but we should no longer only remain within this logic. Advanced materials together with nanotechnologies is a key enabling technology. This has been a good concept for the Commission when it comes to the debate before 2021. But today, the debate is very much about technology sovereignty, uh, that we have supply and value chains for the industry who get challenged, that the industry is focusing a lot on short-term priorities, and given what is going on currently with the, with the consequences of the Ukraine war, war in Ukraine, you see it. But all the more, we have one reason more to have on advanced materials also a long-term perspective. And you see the US is actually doing the same thing. So it's not only Europe starts thinking about this. So that's the one uh, slide. And I give you another example. If you turn to the next slide, look at Japan. Also, you have here an initiative, Materials Integration by Network Technology, the initiative of the National Institute of Materials Science, supported also by the Japanese government. So they have also goals looking at materials engineering, process, structure, properties, and performance, using also uh, computer information science, including artificial intelligence, a question we were getting today. So for us, a big issue is to which extent artificial intelligence could be a game changer and what does this mean? Because uh, we have now a coordinated plan on artificial intelligence in 2019, which starts unfolding. Is there something which we can benefit from for a materials agenda? And you see also in Japan, there is a collaboration with the industry on AI techniques capable of increasing the accuracy of machine learned based predictions of material properties. Voila! So you see here, it's not only Europe which has a debate, other jurisdictions have them. I'm not coming now to slides on Korea and China, but those who are here participating, many of you, in my view, have an idea what is going on. So look into this also if you would like to give feedback to AMI, and 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 to us, not only feedbacks in political terms, but also in terms of what you heard in content. And let me come now to the next slide, because for us, the work will continue. Uh, we have started some technical strands. So one strand is actually that we are currently carrying out a study, a study which is uh, should be publicly available in spring, late spring, May, June where we are looking now, according to the nine innovation markets set out in the Matthias 2030 Manifesto, the so-called Matthias innovation markets. We're looking into market trends, investment trends amongst companies. And there we do a deep dive in, in corporate databases like Orbis. We're looking into this. 
this is a work stream we have started to get also an idea about the market situation. The second one, we are looking into one of the deployment tools. These are the so-called open innovation test beds. This is a tool which has been launched under Horizon 2020. Most of the projects have been launched under Horizon 2020. And we had 300 million euros granted to 29 projects in 10 different fields. And they're all actually related to materials. These are instruments which offer for SMEs testing facilities, and they're focusing a lot on deployment. And at the end, there should be self-funding. We have to consider if we take action advanced materials, whether we bring the follow-up into this advanced materials initiative, yes or no, and the question is how. The tricky question which we have asked to ask ourselves are twofold. First, are the current one reaching a sufficient funding? So will there be self-sustainable? Because if not, that would actually prevent us from launching new open innovation test beds. This is a big challenge in which we are currently looking and we have an ongoing analysis and I hope we can go out soon early this year on this regard. So this is another work stream where we're looking on the deployment side of materials on something which has been launched and no one has raised it so far today but I felt it's important that you get an idea that we are looking into this. Um, and that brings me I think then nearly to the end but the end is actually to say a big thank you. A big thank you to all the speakers because it was a lot of work. We have today the 11th of January uh, and uh, I understood still before Christmas there was lots of preparatory work so it was a tough job I think for many speakers to prepare all the slides and I would like really to congratulate them, to thank them because they're all doing this. There's no fee system, there's no remuneration system. They do it on top of all the rest. So I appreciated this quite a lot. I would like also to thank you all the panelists who came up and got exposed to our questions and gave clear answers. And I noted all of them also what concerns expectations to the commission. Um, and now I will hopefully not break the system, but maybe everybody can, Natalie, you need to help me to unmute the colleagues uh that everyone can clap their hands and uh without saying this maybe uh, we have natalie and jana also opening up their cameras because there have been quite a lot involved in all this. thank you them as well thanks and maybe thank you a lot thank you very much thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm.